explained it. And we are live on Oz Property Investors. We bring the big names. We have the big fun. And we have the guest co-host, the, the man, the myth, the pizza and property, Todd Sloan. <laughs> Hey, thanks for jumping hey guys, on. How, you go? how are you, Jeff? How, how are you going, man? Yeah, yeah, re- really, uh, re- really fantastic. Then it's just, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm ex- I love my Wednesday nights where I get to talk property because I, th- I think about it a lot in my, in my sort of, uh, in my your regular type thing. So it's, uh, it's great to be able to jump on these sessions. How are you going, Steve? I'm good. How good is it having Toddy instead of Joe for a change? Oh yeah, boot it, boot it, boot him out. We'll see, see if he's finally see professional. Again. <laughs> so you see how we get yeah see how it goes next week we may even have another special co-host guest but yeah, yeah but it's not about not about next week it's about this week it's about the 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 man the the big big man on campus steve polizzi so um this is going to be an interactive kind of session todd's going to be along asking questions left right and center i'm going to be here um sort of facilitating and the audience we'd love if, if you guys smash the smash the like button get it get on the comments we love any engagement interaction and, it, and we love questions as well because there's going to be a special giveaway towards the end there's, there's sort of sort of some questions so for the best if you have a really fantastic question pop it in and we'll either get to it on the fly or towards the end so without further ado let's uh, do the quotes of the week uh, from, from the three of us. So Steve, you're the guest. So what is your quote of the week? All right. So I saw this just on Facebook a couple of weeks ago. It's from a lady called Suze Orman. She's like an American financial kind of person who's involved in like uh, shares and trust and stuff. And the quote is, I'll read it twice because I had to read it twice for it to really sink in. So the quote is, a big part of financial freedom is having your heart and mind free from the worry about the what ifs of life. Mm-hmm. So I'll read that again. A big part of financial freedom is having your heart and mind free from the worry about the what ifs of life. So does that basically just mean like everything's taken care of? Basically you got no regrets because, because most people with the thing, and I have this chat with every client is like, what are you actually trying to achieve? And they're like, Oh, I'd love to be able to travel the world or do this or hang out with my friends more often. That's yeah. people's definition of financial freedom. And the reason I like the quote was I've never actually heard it that way. People only do it to more with, by choice. They want to have free choice in life. But this is the opposite. They're, she's almost looking at back retrospectively saying, I don't want to regret. I don't want to have any what ifs of should I have started that business? Should I have traveled the world? Should I have had a family? Should I have fallen out with my friend? So I like the kind of flip side of the, the quote. Should I have yeah, gotten blonde just... tips? Oh, what was that? Should you have got blonde I tips? Should... <laughs> I don't oh, know. Should, that, that is a what if that I regret. Do you? Do you hey, I, regret I it? looks I all right. It's kind of cool, man. I look like a Syrian footballer. You got that, oh. that video that I sent you the other day? I did. My, 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 my fiance actually thought it was me when I showed her. She's like, what is this? <laughs> I wanted to post that in the Oz Property Group, but I didn't think you'd approve of it, Jeff. I don't know if you've seen it. But oh, it, it was... Maybe. I, I I approve a lot more of what um yeah send it to me I mean because um I don't I don't know I sort of I have to I have to uh, sort of uh, measure some of my sort of things that I would sort of uh, responses because I, I want to make sure we're we're having a respectful group but um yeah send it to me I'm, I'm kind of keen you send it to me now aren't you Todd I'm, I'm gonna yeah, and I'm gonna look um, at it while I'm trying to have the yeah, yeah so yeah that's, that's I, a, I love that quote yeah. sorry again I don't think it's disrespectful I just didn't think it was appropriate that was all. <laughs> If it's, uh, but yes, I mean, we, we love we love we love the funny memes. If you if you couldn't tell, particularly Joe, but uh, no, that's really interesting. You you kind of say that, Steve, because I was listening to a podcast today with with a, a mutual kind of friend, Selena Kulkani, and she was on James. She was talking about you set the goalpost and you achieve that, and and then you sort of say, okay, they, they, they were talking about net worth versus kind of um, versus revenue or income. And it's sort of, it's a dichotomy between that. And some people sort of say, okay, great. I've hit, I don't know, 100K passive income or whatever it is. And then they say, okay, I'm going to now, I now need 500K passive income. It's kind of, well, when when do you stop and how um, how much is enough? It's yeah, the, the, the thing I like about it is it's not actually, you're not hitting like a passive income target. She didn't actually say like, oh, 100K passive income. It's mm-hmm. financial freedom. Some, yep. some of my friends are the happiest guys I know and they're not wealthy at all. Like one of my mates who just loves life, he's a barber in Manly on the Northern Beaches. He works for six to 12 months and then disappears for two years traveling. 
So if you ask mm-hmm. who's got the better life, us sitting doing a white collar job in the office 10 hours a day or him, yep. everyone's actually going to say him, but we're way better financially off. So I just like how they kind of flip that quote on the other, the other way around. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Todd, you, you've got uh, your kind you got you, we were talking about a couple of quotes. What's one that you um, want to throw at us this week? Well, I think it kind of fits perfectly to, to what Steve's saying. I've been listening to, to Jimmy Carr's new book. I just finished it the other day. It's called uh, Before and Laughter. And there's a whole other side of that man that I just never knew existed. I first saw it in that uh, diary of a CEO interview with him. And, and he talks about like the, it's not the quote, but talking about like how basically how much does it cost to not live your dreams? And he's like, mm-hmm. most people, it's like 35,000 pounds a year. Basically refers to when he was like this uh, young marketing exec for, for Shell. And then he just quit to, to become a, a comedian with no experience. But the quote that I love in there, that I'll censor, that's not quite so verbatim Jimmy Carr because Jimmy Carr speaks like a drunken pirate. Um, but there's nothing you can buy at the mall today that you're going to give a crap about in five years' time. And I think fitting to almost kind of like what I think Steve's saying with this as well is just chasing stuff and chasing money for the sake of money. There's no point. It's like, if, but if you can actually chase that, that happiness and if, if money kind of brings that, well, great, then you've got that freedom. But yeah, I think that's a really important one. Yeah, well, no, definitely. Well, mine's, uh, mine's, mine's uh, I, I mean, we could talk about quotes for the whole kind of um, we're trying to keep this to an hour and a half to respect yours on but um the so my one's actually tony robbins and if you haven't heard of tony i would, I would suggest to look him up but um the you only heard of tony. journey is is the, is the one you never begin so i think that's that's kind of a pro it's really corny really cheesy and i almost feel a little kind of i feel a little icky saying it because it's like oh it's super like Pump, pump your chest and like I know like yeah yeah one of the I'm just going crazy <laughs> but yeah it's one of those yeah but you, you, it actually is completely true because everybody says oh yeah it's hard and it's it, I can't do it but how do you know you can't do it if you like your trip from Melbourne to Adelaide where you where you walked right or you did walk or did you cycle and, and cycling was Darwin to Adelaide walking was um, Melbourne Adelaide to Melbourne Jeez, yeah. yeah but but to think you did you ever think you were ever going to do that in your life no, no, and that was one of the fuels is um, doing something that felt impossible. I actually had this talk with my nephew the other day because he's having a bit of a hard time with things. And I just said, the best thing you can do is find something that you think is impossible and do it. And, and he straight away is like, oh, I don't want to do a big walk. I'm like, don't do the shit that I did. Like what you feel is impossible. I think that's, that's the important thing because once you've done that, it's like, yeah, what else is impossible that's not impossible? Yeah, yeah, fantastic kind of message. And look, um, you mentioned there is having a bit of a hard time. If anybody does ever have, is ever having a hard time, and it's kind of something you get too much, reach out to those Beyond Blue, um, all those kind of lifeline that sort of stuff as well. I just wanted to pick that up because I don't think we sort of talk about mental health. With, I don't know if it is mental health, but um, yeah, just um, wanted to to mention that. Yeah, no, good point, man. Yeah, but look, let's um, before we get into the the content, the session, we we do have to um, acknowledge one of our one of our lovely sponsors, and let's uh, let's get into that, and then we will we'll introduce, and we're going to get into the due diligence because I've been excited to ask questions about this all day, and I've been thinking about it. I've even been dreaming due diligence, maybe not, but um, no, I, I I do I do dream property sometimes, and I wake up and I'm like, oh shit, yeah, but yeah, let's let's get into that, and then we'll introduce the per- if you don't know who he is, I'm sure you do. But we'll get into that and then get into the value. So we'll get amongst. I've just got to actually figure out how to do this. It's my first day here, I promise. This is Joe's job normally, isn't it? It is. It is Joe's job. So just have to work, work out which tab am I clicking? Oh, window. Here we go. We do have it. Selling a property. It isn't something we do every single day. There's actually more involved in the process than you may initially think. Like, how do you find the best agent? How do you ensure that you're going to pay the lowest fees? It's not easy. And then also throw in all the stress and pressure of selling. And that's why Scott Agate, a former real estate agent and expert property negotiator from Hello House, has created his leading agent finder service. After a 20-year career managing agents himself, Scott has personally conducted over 3,000 property transactions along with running three Bell franchises. He knows all these agent tricks. Scott has created an in-depth five-step process for his leading agent finder service. First, he establishes the true market value for your property. 
uses a triangulation method to shortlist the leading agents, creates a competitive environment for those agents to send through their best proposals, vets those proposals, and then he negotiates the best agent fees for you. This ensures that you're not only getting the best rate for selling, but most importantly, you have a leading agent on your side selling your property to maximize the end sale value. Oh, and did I mention, this service is completely free. If you'd like to know exactly how Scott runs his five-step leading agent finder service, he's detailed it with the link below. Or if you'd like to speak with Scott to help find you the leading agent in your area, book a call today. Yeah, there we go. It's actually it. kind of cool to, to watch that um, because sometimes I'm sort of clicking off, but that's a, it's a re the triangulation method. I mean, that's, it's a, it sounds like I, a made up word. I actually love his service. Like I, I sold a property a year ago and it's just one of those ones and Toddy can probably talk about this is you don't know who to choose as a real estate agent because most of the ones that win all the awards actually don't care about the sale price. They're more turnover. They just want to do as many sales as possible. Then the little guys who are well rated, you go, oh, they're little. They're not going to have a big database. So you actually, you actually have no idea who you actually choose. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're actually finding that kind of right now, trying to get solar for the house. Every single solar company just kind of sounds the same and they all just want to pitch, pitch, pitch. And I said that to Bianca as soon as we were doing this. I'm like, this must be how people feel when they're trying to choose a real estate agent, just don't know anything about the industry. Yeah, and you don't know, like, do you choose the nice guy or do you choose the slimy shark? Who's, who's actually better at getting you the best price? Yeah, I personally, I'm not I'm not a fan of the whole shark. I think I've got a belief if they'll do it with you, they'll do it to you. But, but that's just me. It is. I think it's the type of property you're selling as well. If you're selling like a, a penthouse in Sydney kind of thing, it might be a slightly different demographic or cultural or things like that. But um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Speak to Scott. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. What he's there for. I, I, I must. I must say similar, um, similar view. I have used Scott that particular service, and it's um, yeah. I mean, I don't want to turn this into another ad because. Yeah, I think he's he's already paid for one. So, yeah. So anyway, um, so on hey, to we, the the person, the person. The sorry, man. Do we pay for these ads? No, you don't. I mean, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so Polizzi, the the man, he's been in the group. I think you've been in. You were in the first at least a thousand members. I imagine. I, I I can't can't keep track of that. But you acquired a property portfolio that allowed you to leave the workforce before the age of thirty. It's interesting. It says before rather than by. Is there, a, is there a distinction between buyer? Oh, it's the same thing, isn't it, right? I was like, I, I think I became a buyer's 29. agent when I was 27, 28. So that's, that's yep. buy 30. 30 sounds, sounds, yeah. sounds better for the media. Yeah, it does. So, and your philosophy, though, is that you, you want to increase wealth and passive income with as, and with as little as possible. And that's why I suppose we wanted to talk due, due diligence. That's a tough word to say. But you've you've bought over a thousand properties uh, Australia wide in every capital city. It says, and all the major regional towns that are at, at around Australia. So tell me, when when you say regional, what does regional mean to you? Like, what does what does that actually mean? Good question. Just not not a capital city. So outside of a okay. standard capital city, um, yep. it means anything. Anything outside the capital city, it can be a town of five thousand people, which I don't recommend buying in, or it can be twenty thousand, yep. it can be a uh, hundred and hundred fifty thousand. But then there's there's ones that aren't really considered regional, which is still quite large. Like uh, Wyong on the central coast has a bigger population than Darwin, so <laughs> Darwin's considered a capital city, but Wyong has a bigger population. So it's just yeah, it's it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you buy. We've spoken about this in the Oz Property Forum so much. It's capital city doesn't mean better capital growth. It's it's about fundamentals and what you're trying to achieve. There we go. That's as Joe would say. That's one of those gold nuggets. Capital, capital city doesn't necessarily equal capital growth, because um, I mean, they're the, yeah, I'm sure you. I, so I, think I saw a stat for residentials. Like 17 out of the best 20 performers in the last uh, 10 years were re regional towns. So they weren't actually capital cities. It's just a, it's just a bit of a myth. Yes, there's yeah. there's low, there's some lower risk nature to capital cities because there's a diverse, diverse diverse workforce and industries and things like that. Um, yeah. But there's cities within cities, like uh, for Sydney, for instance, Parramatta is completely different to Northern Beaches, which is completely different to the CBD. So they're their own little kind of mini cities in a way. Yeah. Have, have you ever bought a uh, Have you bought a commercial any property in Byron before? Just out of interest, I was just thinking not, about not, it. Not way yeah. too expensive. I know, I know, I know, guys who have got quite a lot of properties there, but you're, you're talking the multi multi million dollars. Great opportunities 10 years ago, but I wasn't a buyer's agent back then, like solid yield, solid location. But now, 
prices are too high, yields are terrible. You're talking like two, three percent net yields most of the time. Uh, it's just yeah, there's too much hype around that area. Out of interest, yeah. do you actually even still get many clients that are going? Yeah, I'll accept that two, three percent net yield. No, it's generally not my my demographic that I kind of kind of deal with. I, I get some ones that want the the really blue chip ones, and they're happy with say four percent, and then that's you yeah. can get into like the bought like a Bunnings in the past, um, KFC and stuff, things like that, uh, Domino's, ones like that. Um, but again, you start you start getting in the higher price point and a lot of those kind of high net worth investors, they actually just don't want the hassle of the property. They want something on a seven, 10 year lease, set and forget, mm-hmm. done, dusted, move on with their lives. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. So as I said, people, there is going to be a, a bit of a, a special giveaway for, for people who, if they throw questions. So we want to see heaps of questions. So if you, is there anything you think oh, I'd like to know about what, what they're talking about there or I don't understand, ask that question because I'm, I'm, I'm the person who's in charge of picking, um, picking some, some great questions of people that are asking. Um, so we'll skip. We normally, I normally ask about people's first purchase and I was going to ask you about your most interesting or exciting. Actually, you know what? I'm going to ask it. Why not? Let's, let's, um, I mean, we'll try and keep it short, but what is, I, I haven't, I have pre prompted you with this. So please, he's going, he's going a bit wide. I'm not sure what's Jan asking. But what is your most interesting or exciting purchase you've ever done? I was going to. Um, oh, actually, I'll talk about one that's going, sort of going on at the moment. So I bought okay. a, a cafe in Ipswich, which is like okay. 200 meters from the train station, freestanding building, development potential, 10 car spots. The funny thing, I actually wanted it. So one of them didn't like Ipswich. They said, oh, no, it's a bit of a bit of a hole. I don't like it there, which their opinion doesn't matter. It does have nothing to do with capital growth or demographic doesn't change that. And the other one didn't like cafes because they're, they're like cafe owners come and go too often, which I agree, they do. And then all this stuff I actually pointed out. So I give them all the data and they make the decision from there. But for me, it's sort of like owning a, imagine owning a freestanding building with 10 car spots right next to Parramatta Station, for instance. Like it's going to be a solid long-term performer. Um, funny thing, I've had that for about four years now. We actually have changed cafe owners. So nothing affected with the lease, just the, the owner sold the business on to another owner. So had that change. But the big thing at the moment that I'm going through is they're actually, so it's next to Bendigo Bank. So it's a big like 12-story office tower. Across the road is Ipswich Council's building where all the office workers work. But because of COVID, they're not going in, obviously, as much. They're working from home. So there's actually a little bit less foot traffic and people going through for the cafe. So they're struggling a bit. So did give him a little rental concession just to help him out. But what's actually happening is they're converting the Ipswich Council building into a medical precinct. So this is great news for me in 10 years' time. So it's all happening now. They're, they're doing construction now. We're about three years away. Lots of opportunity for me to knock down, redevelop, change it into a medical type building or a GP clinic or specialized office suite, whatever it may be, or just keep it as a cafe, keep it as the go-to cafe for the medical precinct. So I've actually got too many options at the moment. So I'm speaking to two different town planners, working out what's possible on the block, what we should do. Now I'm in a weird wait and hold position. Do I sign the tenant up for another five-year lease? Do I try to get them on a three or two-year lease? Or do I just say, because we're at the end of the lease, I think uh, mid, mid this year, um, do we just do we just kick him out and go for gold and see how we go? Do we build residential? Do we try to make some accommodation for residential people visiting the medical precinct? Or do we do a commercial with the residential on top? There's actually too many options. And it's just one of those, I don't know which one the right answer is. And that's, that, that's fine. I'm just going to just keep going, see how we go. Keep talking to property managers, town planners, get the feet on the ground for the people who know what the demand is and then make the decision from there. How, how big is your footprint on that site? Oh, you're asking the tough questions now. I'd be about 900 square meters on that. Yeah, okay. It's pretty big and, building. It's a, yeah. it's, a, it's a very narrow block though. So even though I've got development potential up to 42 mm-hmm. meters, because I still need to get a driveway down the side and car park or potentially go down, build an underground car park, I can actually only build to about four stories just from stability. Um, and funny enough, I, I actually worked that out myself because I used to be a structural engineer. So I know what the stability requirements are. And I went, okay, we can't go too much here. The, the town planner was actually surprised when I sent him the calculation. He's like, how do you know how to do this? I'm like, oh, <laughs> my job. Uh, so you're not going to like uh, do what they did down there. What was it? West 57th Street in New York. And don't they have like the slimmest skyscraper there? It's got like an eight meter frontage. And it oh, goes really? up like 100 stories or something <laughs> <Yeah>. crazy. <laughs> 
I, I think um, mine's not mine's not that different from that. I think it's about a twelve meter frontage. But there you go, challenge yeah. accepted. <laughs> what? How much? Um, before we get into the the crux and the due diligence checklist, how much of that did you do prior to purchasing, or did you just like the numbers and you thought, like, yeah? I mean, did you kind of did you do did you run the whole um, kind of process yourself on the? So this, this was, yeah, so basically I presented this to clients. So I had half the job done already. And then when none of them wanted yep. it, I bought it myself. In terms of the development potential stuff, I'll admit, I didn't actually do anything at the time besides look up the code and go, yep, I can build up 42 meters. This gives me some options down the track. Um, but I, yep. I got it on a, I think it was a three by three year lease. So it was just one of those ones. I'm like, hey, that's three years times problem. But I know the value add. Same thing with resi clients, how they want to buy like a block with, granny flat potential or subdivision potential. Most of the time they don't actually do it. It's just a pie in the sky kind of type thought. Um, and a lot of times people actually, they've gone off tangent here in residential, they'll buy something with subdivision potential or granny flat potential, pay a premium for it, but then not actually realize that premium because they just set and forget it. So why pay an extra mm -hmm. 50, 100 grand for the property when you get the same amount of rent when you could have spent that 100 grand on another property? That's such a good point. Uh, one of the the first that I bought was um, 2,000 square meters, but I didn't pay extra for that. But I remember putting everything off to one side because eventually one day I will subdivide it. But if I had have paid a premium for that, you're right. That would have just been money sort of sitting there doing nothing. It's just it, most of the time, it's great to have and it will help you in 20 years time, but it doesn't just automatically accelerate your portfolio. I'd much rather mm. accumulate in as much as you can now and then do that. I'd rather have 10 properties over the next five years than two properties that I've got to hold on to for 20 years, then make a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, but again, it's just, mm -hmm. it's just personal preference, what you're trying to achieve over what time frame, how aggressive you want to be, what your risk profile is, what your capital versus your serviceability is and all that type of stuff. It's, it's interesting you should say that because it sounds <laughs> like, um, and, and as you say, it's all about the, your own circumstance, your own risk tolerance, all that sort of good stuff. Um, but it sounds like you would prefer to, let's just say you had a, a, a $2 million thing, you, you'd go and split that up in, in sort of six or seven assets as opposed to buying two, would you? Or I mean, I'm not saying. No, it just depends. Depends, depends on personal preference. Like if you're okay. a low income earner, for instance, and you know serviceability is going to be a problem, going buying $2 million residential properties that might be negatively geared is going to kind of do you. Whereas if you yep. buy, say, four, 500,000 ones that are neutral or positive, you might be able to squeeze another one in. So instead of having a two mil portfolio, you have a 2.5 mil portfolio. So it's just just trying to assess your own circumstances. I got clients where serviceability is an issue. They're, they're high net worth. You just buy. They, did, they just want blue chip, good location, don't care about cash flow. And then other ones where we're really scrimping to save $20,000 on purchase price. Is that blue chip like best? At, oh, sorry, Jeff. I was about, um, you, I think you're right to ask the same question. Go on. Potentially. That when you say like you've got clients that really want that blue chip and they're just earning a lot more money, is that potentially where a lot of it comes from then? Because from what you're saying, you can obviously still make great money in regional towns. Yeah. You, you can still make great money at lower price points. But if you are someone that just earns six, $700,000 a year, you're an orthodontist, whatever it is, and you can just easily go out and go, yeah, I'll just buy a $2 million, $5 million investment property, whatever it is. It's more about, I don't want hassle. I'm fine with a, a lower yield and all that kind of stuff. But those are generally the people like societally that a lot of us would look up to and go, wow, they're doing so well. What are they doing? But then missing all of those other pieces of the puzzle. So it's not necessarily the blue chip investment is the only way to do it. Does that kind yeah, of make sense? I, I actually don't like the term blue chip because it kind of alludes to that you're going to get better capital growth, which is just That's not I mean. blue chip for me just means it's everyone's standard definition of a, a good area not a the best ROI, for instance. So like one of my, one of my clients, um, he's an anaesthetist. He's got, uh, we bought two properties on uh, Rwana Beach on the Sunshine Coast. Mm -hmm. one, was, one was two mil, one was like 2.2 mil. They're very negatively geared. And I know I probably could have got a better ROI buying some regional towns and things like that. But with the income he's on, that's just a nest egg for him. Like, and I, I know that's going to be worth more in 20 years' time. There's no, no question about it. He's got a beachfront property, 1,000 square metres, walk straight onto the beach. Um, so that's just a nice safe investment. But like you said, Todd, him squabbling over 20 grand here and there in terms of cash flow is not, not a big deal for him. Yeah, what do they yeah. say? It costs Bill Gates more to pick up $300 when it falls out of his pocket than to leave it. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, heard, I heard that one. Yeah, it's funny. Um, what what I was going to ask is similar, but it, what is it? And I know you said you don't really like blue chip, but would you? Let's pretend you're okay with blue chip. Um, what what is the diff? Is there much difference between a? I mean, I think the answer is probably yes. But what is the what are the difference between a blue chip commercial versus a blue chip resi? Yeah, that's or a good question. Different? So, no, there, there definitely is. So, like an A class kind of blue chip one is like a tenant that people will generally know. So, like a multinational or Australia-wide tenant with multiple offices. They're the big names that people know, like the KFCs, the Dominoes, the Bunnings, the Kennards, all those types of ones. Even office, like I don't like buying offices at the moment, but if you get like a, a big name in the kind of finance industry, someone where people just basically see that as a reliable industry, mm. and they generally are because they're a bigger company, they're less volatile. Like they rent a space with room to grow. They don't just rent out at 100% capacity like a sole trader might. They actually rent it out with 30% capacity. So they sign longer leases. They got room to move. They stay there generally longer term. But you actually, similar to Resi, you actually get less of a yield typically because of the premium. So mm. you're balancing like a 4% net yield versus a 6% net yield. So you actually need to get about 25, 30% more capital growth out of it just to remain on par with the, the lower risk one. So it's all about looking over what time frame versus what you're actually trying to achieve with the property. Because that's a huge yeah. difference there, two percent. When you capitalize that, like, uh, uh, so compound that over the next 20, 30 years, that's massive. Have you ever done the and, numbers on? Uh, people get confused as well, Todd, with two percent thinking two percent over like a hundred percent, but two percent over four percent is actually fifty percent different in cash flow. And yeah. that, that when you say it like that, is actually a much bigger number. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 And it, and and it, and then it compounds, of course. So let's just say they one one's one's both assets are a million dollars. Um, one grows at two percent, the other grows at four percent. Then you've got then then after the first year, the one that grows four percent will be one one million and forty thousand. I think that's yeah, that's right. And and the other is one million twenty thousand. And and then you get two. I mean, of course, it doesn't grow the same this, rate every year. This is the whole argument as well, Jeff. And you have the same thing with residential. People will claim the blue chip will have better capital growth, better rental increases. Where they'll claim the regional towns, the rents stay the same. So if you've got mm -hmm. you've got the exact same arguments, there's just way more moving parts in commercial because there's different asset classes, different types of tenants even different types of leases, like the leases different in terms of rental growth and things like that. So way more moving parts and you can never actually get a right answer because you can never compare apples and apples in commercial. I've just yeah. put this and just, just on the capital growth side of things, I've just got a little cash flow calculator here, but it also works out long-term capital growth. A million dollar property. Can you share screen, Todd? Or, or can you share uh, screen? I don't think I can. Oh, okay, probably not. Can yet. I? No, if you hit sorry, the... no, it's too hard. Sorry. Oh, can I? Uh, where do we go? Share. You might you might have to log in, log out. Okay, now that's all right. It'll be quicker just yeah. to say it. Basically, both million dollar properties, six percent capital growth versus four. If I scroll down here, if you look after where is it, five years, um, we've got one point three three eight uh, versus one point two one six. So it's like wow. oh, okay, not not too much, yeah. but but decent amount. But it's when you go to ten years, it's one point seven nine versus one point four eight, and twenty years is three point two versus two point one. Wow, that's yeah. I mean, it's it's insane, isn't it? Yeah, you're talking literally. I think it was a million dollars, or, or just under. Yeah, it? yeah, just about a uh, yeah, about a million dollars. Yeah, there you go. Well, that's um, that's that's a nice little dovetail into the due diligence checklist because we're about thirty minutes in, and we're kind of just. I feel like we're having a having a chat at a barbecue with a couple of beers. So, it's just. I mean, I'm having my uh, my non alcoholic beer. But let's let's get into the checklist, please. Uh, I want I want to see this, man, because let's let's get some questions. So you want to share your? Is that the easiest way to do it? Share screen yeah, and let's. let's, 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 let's go there's down. been some great questions in the comment box already, and and Nick's asking if he's eligible for the giveaway. I I, I don't know if he maybe we should just give it to him. I mean, I don't know. Probably yeah, should. Where's the yeah, comment no. box? I can't see it, Jeff. Oh, if you you might on the right hand side. Uh, I don't know. If, oh, gotcha. Yeah. Sorry, so sometimes can... I swear I'm an 80 year old trapped inside a 35 year old's body. Yeah, that that's all right. It's it's too distracting though. It's it's like a bright shiny object. So here, talk talk to us, please. We've got here. We've got uh, property information. So this is your your hundred points. So it's a hundred point because there's literally hundred items. Yeah, there's probably not a hundred items. I just wrote a hundred items because it sounded fancy. So I don't <laughs> have no idea how many there are. There's probably more. But um, uh, anyway. This is available on my website if you want, free download, or you can, I'll chuck it in the Oz Property Forum as well so you can download it. 
This yep. is the, the biggest thing I have. So when I do due diligence reports for clients, basically we go through this checklist and we expand it out. So theoretically, the due diligence um, report could be 150 pages or so. Oh, we're going to wrap the screen. Can you see my screen all right? I can, yeah. We can see two screens though. You've got, yeah, there you go. Yep, you're good. That's better. Yep. Yeah, and I've, I've actually found this in the, the hard in the past with clients is if I give them a 150-page due diligence report, their brain just explodes and they just, they just go, no, nah, this is too much info or too scary or they'll just call me up and say, Steve, just tell me if it's a good property or not. If mm -hmm. I go too small in terms of the report, I give them a five-page report, they kind of go, oh, yeah, could have done this myself. And they, they kind of don't see the value in a buyer's agent. So my due diligence reports are about 45 pages and I found that's a good mix between giving people enough information they get comfort in the property but not too much they're getting overwhelmed or too little that they, they don't think we've checked enough. So this is the base of where you go through. So we won't go too much into depth for this because I actually go through a due diligence report, which will answer most of the questions. But similar to Resi, you want to actually go check the site out, check easements, flood zones, body corporate reports, all that type of stuff. Um, with commercial, you've got OH&S type stuff you need to look at because on sites they can actually be having hazardous materials and fumes and things like that. Um, in addition, because uh, you're effectively owning a property, you're going to have service contracts. So it's sort of like a body corporate. You've got like roof maintenance, air conditioning uh, maintenance, landscaping, all that type of stuff. The tenant will actually pay for that, but you still need to check it. So you need to go through and check because sometimes they might be on, say, a gross lease, which they, you'll actually pay it, and then they'll also receive the rent. And you can also save some money for you or your client as well by reducing some of the maintenance costs. Mm -hmm. value add opportunities and that, that's probably a good one for the property that i'm going to show you for the due diligence report um there's way more options with value add for commercial so you've you've got the standard development stuff where you subdivide um, add extra rooms and retail and all that type of stuff but you can also raise the rent you can renovate you can market the property better you can change the use of it you can build residential on top and all that type of stuff as well before we uh, before we go any further, can, can I just um because I'm I'm going to somewhat be a little bit like what uh, a little bit somewhat, somewhat like Joe, what what's the, what are some of the what are some of the areas or what are some of the reasons why somebody should consider like if I'm buying my first or second resi or commercial and I'm sort of just I've landed on landed on Earth from planet whatever planet Krypton or something I couldn't think of anything <laughs> else but yeah let's say if, why is due diligence in, important and what are some of the things that you've uncovered. Um, some of the real gotchas or what are some of the, the regular things? I've asked about four questions there, sorry. The, the, the main thing is you can get caught out much easier than residential. A residential, if, you, if you're going, as long as you're buying an okay suburb and your property's not riddled with termites or got settlement issues or in a flood zone or something like that, you're going to yeah. be okay long term. The, the property over the next 30 years, whether or not you pick the market well, will perform reasonably well over the next 30 years. Commercial, because you've got the added part of you're actually buying into a certain type of industry. Like people need a roof over their heads no matter what. When you go commercial, you're different industries. So you're talking like a retail versus industrial versus office. What are they going to look like in 30 years? And then in that particular area, what are they going to look like? Like what area are they servicing? Are they nationwide? Is it near a port? Is it near an airport? Is it servicing the local area like a fabricator or something like that? So you look at that. Um, but the big one where people get caught out on is actually just not checking out like for the numbers. So like the tenant, for instance, mm -hmm. they might be paying a higher rent than the market rate. Mm -hmm. And because the value of the commercial is based on the rent that you receive, so it's based on the net yield or cap rate, as you call it in the industry, you might overpay by 10% because you have the 10% rent higher. Um, so you burn yourself that way. The other one is the tenant's going to leave. So you, you might buy a property based on the fact that it's got a three-year lease, for instance. But if there's no bond or guarantee on the lease, they theoretically could declare bankruptcy, pack up shop and leave, and then you're left without a tenant. And again, you've overpaid then for a property in a lease that you didn't actually own. Um, so those types of things that you need to look at. The other one is just future developments as well. Some people, if they're, they're trying to, they, they might find a really high yield going, oh, this is great. I've got a high yield. And they buy a little retail shop. What they don't realise is one street away, they're building a, a Westfields or a Woolworth shopping centre or something like that. So you go out and buy like a little supermarket thinking, oh, this is great. There's no competition in the area. If you haven't checked the future developments in the area, you, you're going to be very, very well surprised in five years' time when they knock that up. So 
let, there's this more room to make mistakes. And we'll, we'll go through one of my due diligence reports and we kind of cover all of this. Um, there's a lot to check. It's, it's not, not a five-hour process like it is with residential where we're talking 20 to 40 hours for a standard commercial. So one of the things that always made me a little bit wary about commercial property, and I'd say there's probably others thinking the same thing, is the, the amount that you'd have to understand about the business and how it operates and like strengths and weaknesses and how it's going in the industry. And it's like, there was just so many moving parts to it. Does this list actually help people then open that up? And are there sections where it's like, get to know the business better? Yep, exactly right. So so we do a, like a, a tenant interview. So you actually talk yep. to your tenant. So have a half hour kind of chat with them, find out, find out who their comp- competitors are and things like that. But if you're starting out, don't buy a specialized type of asset. Like don't go out and buy something that's like freestanding, sitting there by itself, that's completely dependent on foot traffic or the area. Go buy something simple. Go buy an industrial warehouse, which is just three concrete tilt-up panels and a roller door. So if they actually do ever leave, anyone can be a tenant. It can be a yep. car mechanic, a panel beater, fabricator, storage, distributor. That's got really good versatility. And you can also kind of check out in the same complex or the joining complex what types of businesses are operating there and get a pretty good gut feel of what vacancy rates are, what rent per square meter is and things like that. The one I show you is going to be a really creative one, which is going to kind of make it more confusing for people. But I specifically chose it because I actually want to show how far down the rabbit hole you can go with certain things. Uh, But I'll I'll show a simple little warehouse first and then we'll go into the one I'm going to show. So it is a lot more work, but just keep it simple for the first one or two. Don't don't go too creative and try to... And this is one of those ones we've mentioned before. People always want something with development potential. You don't have to develop to make money. Like... I know so many investors that have made so much money and they've done nothing but buy properties. They don't, don't even renovate. They just buy the properties. They get the capital growth. They get the cash flow and they do really well. Mm. Yeah. Are, are we able to jump into to one of those now? Or is there a few extra questions you wanted to ask, Jeff? Oh, let's, let, 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 let's get into it. Let's, uh, let's keep getting into, oh, sorry, let's get into the, the due diligence sort of checklist side of it. Um, yeah. I'd love uh, to see this warehouse. Well, actually, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of, because I, I know we'd love to, yeah, I think the, the practical side of the examples is really fantastic and amazing. Let's, we'll spend the bulk of the time on that. But, um, That's right. yeah. uh, let me know once the screen pops up. Oh, sorry, I've got to press the button. <laughs> that's, uh, that's quickly, I'll quickly scroll through this and then I'll show the little yeah. warehouse just so you get an idea yeah. and then we'll go into the, the fun one. Um, so same thing with residential and what I just mentioned then about you've got to check future developments in the area. But then with the actual yep. property itself, you actually need to make sure you've got like fire certificates, check the heritage list thing, all the building certificates. So there's a lot more actual documentation when it comes down to it. Um, I'll Actually, I should show you one of the folders. One, one of the property folders that we have for each property normally has about 12 different folders. And in each folder, there's about 10, 15 documents. So like you, you don't get that, you don't get that with residential. Like there's just so many kind of, and this is why the checklist is important because you go through and you, you tick them all off and make sure you're not missing anything. Uh, here's, the, here's the thing that Todd was interested in the tenant interview. Yeah. So we'll, yeah. we'll, go, we'll go through all this. Um, awesome. then you check out the business, check out the development. So was that Jeff? I was going to, I'm sure Todd might've, might've thought about asking this as well, but how do you, when, when you're asking for these documents from, I think Todd may have even asked this in one of the chats he's had with you, when you're asking for these, how, um, I mean, cause I, I imagine some tenants would balk or some businesses, they would say, oh, look, I'm not handing that over. How do you sort of go about that conversation usually? Is it pretty that's, straightforward? That's, that's, that's tough. So actually we had yesterday, we had a, a tenant who th- said our questions were too invasive and they didn't want to talk to us. So you get, you get random ones like that. But because the contracts are subject to due diligence, if you're not happy, you can just crash the deal and you move on with it. This one, we're actually probably going to proceed, even though they're not answering our question, because it's a pretty simple warehouse. It's like an 800K warehouse. There's got a good bond and a guaranteed. And you just will find some, some blue collar or even white collar people. They're just a bit rough around the edges and they, they feel like, oh, no, you, you don't get to know my business kind of thing. Same as you get with residential. Some Todd answer this, when you do inspections, some, some tenants are absolutely horrible. They just won't let you have a look at certain things or they'll not, not the sheds off, off these. So I don't want you in the bedroom or whatever it is. You, you sometimes get difficult tenants as well, but you just need to make a call based on that. I had one recently. Two of them were asleep. There were three screaming ch- children running around that they weren't even there. So I don't know where they came from. And there were five of them. This was during an open home. It's yeah, like, hey, <laughs> welcome to your new home. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, but just quick, quickly on that though, Steve, I remember you saying about leases, uh, they're unregulated in the commercial property space. So is there something that you can actually put in there then as an owner to more future protect yourself when you maybe want to go sell five, 10, 20 years time to say some kind of like a compliance clause almost like to comply with any kind of due diligence that a future purchaser might have? Again, you can write whatever you want, but whether it gets upheld is another thing. So the only compliance you generally need is if you buy a retail property, you've actually got the Retail Leasing Act, which you need to follow. But that's just things like you're not allowed to on charge property management or your land tax and things like that. But say like an okay. industrial lease, you can write whatever you want. The, the way I used to explain leases, are it's a guidebook for the owner and tenant to follow. So even though it's a contract and you can sting them for the contract, but it's generally just the rules of the game that you kind of apply to. The main thing you want to check is actually just their, their guarantees. So just what, what security. So this is what we've got about personal guarantees, bonds, bank guarantees. Um, most of the time you want a personal guarantee over like a company guarantee because if the company's going bust and they're going to leave your premises, they're just going to dissolve that company. So good luck trying to get some money out of them. Whereas personal guarantees, that's where they put like their house up for collateral or you can physically have the money sitting there. So you might have a bond as well for the three months, then money with a bank guarantee sitting in the bank and they can only release it should the kind of solicitors agree. So you need to understand a little bit about that as well. And this is where a good solicitor comes into it. Same as residential, you need someone in your corner. Same thing for lease review as well. I can go through the lease and check all the number type of things like the start date, end date, when the bonds are, rental increases, all that type of stuff. But mm. I'm not a lawyer. Like I, I don't understand the leg, like legalities of things. So get your solicitor to actually run through that and make sure you're protected that way as well. And, and I imagine there's specialist commercial lawyers as well, or commercial property lawyers, yeah, or is def that definitely so? Or use a, a conveyancer or solicitor that's well versed in commercial property. Yeah. Um, this, this sort of answers your question before, Jeff, about here's another one that stings people a little bit. When you buy a commercial property, you need to look at who owns the fit out and the make good clause. So the make good clause is basically when they leave, what condition they need to leave the property in. And like, like for, for my cafe that I was speaking about before, I actually own that, that kitchen. So all that kitchen fit out is mine. I need to make sure when the tenant leaves, one, they don't take the kitchen and steal all the things because I actually own it. And two, mm -hmm. if I'm actually not going to use it as a kitchen, I need to be mindful that I probably need to budget five or 10 grand to strip that out if I'm going to change the use because the new tenant's not going to pay for stripping it out. So I'll need to basically renovate the inside of the property to the new type of tenant. And then with the new type of tenant, depending on what they're doing, you may have to give them a rental concession, like a three-month free period so they've actually got time and money to actually fit it out how they want. So there's all these other moving parts which you just don't have with residential. So scrolling back up to, to the rental guarantee, not the rental guarantee, sorry, the um, lease details, I think it was a little bit more um, like the owner guarantee. Yep. Um, just thinking about that, is, is that something that's like very uh, property type specific as well? Because if you've got a lot of like smaller sort of um, warehouses, you might have people that they just don't have a lot of assets. They might own a little business that they're running. So yep. when you're saying, hey, yeah, put your house up as collateral, they're like, I, I don't have it or I've got a massive mortgage. Um, do, do you know what I mean? Is that like yeah, a case no, by case? No, so yeah, case by case. Um, however, if you're buying like a little 500K warehouse, for instance, you're not as, you're not, it's not as critical if they leave and they don't have a bond. If they pay their three month bond and then, because generally they part of the lease, they have to give six months notice and yeah. small warehouses where I'm buying, we're talking vacancy rates of like one to four months on average. So if they give you their notice, you've got three month bond, or they just leave three months, you might only be out a couple months worth of rent. And on a cheap one with interest rates the way they are, it's only a five or 10 grand maximum, even if it's vacant for six months decision. But if you're on a big one where you get like the one I'm going to show you, where you're getting 200, $300,000 worth of rent, that one you'll feel a lot more. So again, a lot of those, sometimes there won't even be bonds or guarantees or personal guarantees as well. So like you said, it is case by case, but the, the norm is there'll be at least a bond and if you can get a company or personal guarantee, that's that's a bonus. All right, cool. Thanks, man. Yeah. There's been there's been some great questions come in. I, I'm, I think this is probably the the session with the most um, the people have really thought about these questions. They must really want this um, giveaway thing. We should, should, we, should we tell we should them what the giveaway some... is so we can really get some questions coming in. 
Oh well, yeah. I mean, you you probably you'll probably say better. It's it's a it's a property plan, is it, Steve? Like, is it is that yeah. what are we? So we'll we go through away? a free strategy session and a yep. property plan. So we'll do three three people with it, um, and I'll be using Jordan, who you've had on the show's gang plans as well. So they'll actually get access to his software. So we're we're talking yep. a couple grand for each person here saving. Can am I eligible? Awesome. No, you're not. It's about to ask the same question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, thought, I, I didn't think I'd be. Because I've asked a few good questions so far. So, um, exactly. yeah. So, of, of this, so we've got repairs and maintenance. So that's an, and even outgoings. I think that's, those are probably, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they'd be ones I'd, I'd want to, if I was, when I'm buying, they'd be ones you look at quite, quite uh, closely to understand what's going on there. So, so this, all... this would be part of the lease review as well, because like, even though it might specify tenant pays 100% of the outgoings, that's, that includes maintenance. So they'll pay council rates, water rates, maintenance, all the bills and things like that. However, sometimes they actually sneak in a little special, special condition of owner is responsible for air conditioning, for instance. And that, that can get real expensive. Like if the air conditioner blows, it blows up or just the general maintenance contracts. You, in a big industrial warehouse, you're talking 20, 30 grand to replace it. So they're the little ones you got to watch out for as well. Yeah, wow. Okay. And, um, um, special conditions. This is kind of what I mentioned before. There's, there's this because it's because it's unregulated. Like Todd said, anything can go. So you need to work out like who owns car parks, who gets control of the land, what can they sublease it out, all that type of thing as well. So, like I said, go go through the checklist when you're looking at a property and tick them off. You won't have to do this. I might point it out. You don't have to do this. As soon as you find a property on real commercial, the, the main thing is check comparable sales, check comparable rents. That'll be a starting point. Then once you know, okay, I'm we're in the price point here of something I'm comfortable with, then you can slowly drip feed all this. Like I don't I don't send this to the real estate agent on day one saying provide all this information. I do 30% of the work up front. Then once we're under contract, then I ask them kind of all this information because we've got the due diligence clause to get through it. If you're going unconditional or you're going auction, sorry, you have to do all this up front. Um, but the agents generally have all this information much readily available if you, it is, if you do need to go unconditional because they know people are signing their life away effectively, so they'll give it all to you in a big package. Um, the tenant interviews are the harder one because they obviously don't want the, the tenant getting harassed by 100 people off real commercial. Um, some tenants request not to be contacted as well. Some real estate agents really hate you talking to the tenant as well. So in those cases, and if they object to it, one, they can actually can't object to you. They can't stop you phoning someone. So you can still do it. But for me, for my relationship with them long term, because I need them to keep sending me off market properties and things like that, we may give them like a questionnaire um, or speak with a couple of property managers in the ground who have actually managed the property in the past and get that. But we'll go through that in the due diligence report. Um, building and pest inspection, same thing as residential. However, there's a bit more kind of going on in terms of like, because it's like a heavy industry property, for instance, you need to look at like what capacity the floor can handle for forklifts and trucks and things like that. Um, yep. so services, of, sorry, oh, sorry, you go. No, you go. I was just gonna say, out of interest, when you say that you do the, the start sort of 30% of it, are you talking about like literally chronologically, as in you're working through the first like one to 30 approximately, or no, no, you do so like sort of. Ten percent of each, or comparable sales, same similar to what you do with residential. Comparable sales, yep. um, and then look at some rents and things like that. And that's that's your base. Then you do a little bit of investigation on the tenant, and then kind of go from there. But we'll go through gotcha. a. Let's just, sorry, I'm going to move myself out of the way. We'll just. I've got, I've got so many so many questions I could have asked, but uh, I, time's absolutely <laughs> flying. But I don't, I don't know about you guys. But time really flies when you're having fun. I, so. I haven't even started showing a report yet. Yeah, oh, yeah, shit, we're 40 minutes in, we're 48 minutes in. So here's, here's a general overview of kind of how I kind of lay it out for clients just so you get. So it's basically the due diligence checklist just rolled out with here's the thing because it's, it's not just tick box. You actually have to give some information. But mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just show this one quickly just so you can get a feeling for kind of what you can buy. This is just a warehouse office where back access has office, front is a warehouse. But and when people say you commercial is hard to get into, so this one just settled a couple of weeks ago. Um, city of Coburn, so this is over in Perth, three hundred thousand dollars, ninety-three square meters, two by two year lease. Um, and we spoke to the tenant on this one; they're staying long term. Dental lab as well, which is interesting. So it's actually medical in an industrial property, and this this is the whole wow. thing with commercial. You actually don't know what you're going to get until you find it. Um, Did you say Coburn? 
Coburn. You know you spelled that wrong. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I was going to say, it looks, looks I, like Cockburn to me. But... I actually heard Jeff, you actually spoke about it, Jeff, a couple of months ago on one of your lives, and I heard you say it, and I just laughed. <laughs> oh, did I? I did that anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's fine. But I'll, I'll, know, go, I'll, I'll go a quick scroll through just because it might help you guys with your questions so you're not kind of asking cart before the horse type stuff. So we're like, look at the location of it, um, go through what kind of stuff's going on, check zoning, obviously, um, flood zones, easements, overlays, all that type of stuff. Um, oh, there's flood zones. Um, check what services you have to the property as well. Um, that allows, this one's not important, uh, but the next property I'll show you will be because it's a body corporate, so you're not going to develop the land or anything like that. Get all the titles. Um, check out the lease. So this is a summary that I was talking about that I'll go through, and then the solicitor will then check out the kind of legalities of it. Um, uh, very, uh, so the lease has, uh, lease has a variation on it. So we, mm. we found out it wasn't actually signed. We went through it. Um, I'll go through a bit quicker. I was not going to get through it. Uh, what's, the, um, what's the issue of a deed of variation not being signed? Is that, I mean, is that? Well, effectively what you're looking at the lease doesn't actually apply anymore. But when they supplied the, the variation, so when we're checking like the rent that they're paying and things like that, and that's actually changed or the lease terms have changed or there's responsibility change, if it's not a signed document, it doesn't actually mean anything. It's just a bit of a handshake agreement between the owner yeah. and the tenant. So just, you just again, it's about crossing the T's and dotting the I's. And 90% of the time, you probably won't burn yourself, but you don't want to be that 10% where something comes and bites you back in the bum in two years' time if the tenant's crying poor or something like that. Um, council information. I'm going to go a bit quicker because we'll go through some of the next one. Outgoing check. You need to check all the outgoings, make sure they match what the tenant's paying versus what the actual rates stay. Um, then we've got body corporate rates, uh, da, 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 tenant check. So this is the interview we do with the tenant. We speak to them on the phone or do a Zoom with them. Um, council approval for the building. Um, check out the tenant's business as well. Make sure they've never been kind of financially bankrupt and they've actually registered with ABN and tax and all that type of thing. Insurance, so check what by insurance the uh, body has, the body corporate has, what insurance the tenant has for public indemnity and things like that. Yeah. Um, then we've got comparable sales and comparable rents, which we'll go through all that as well. You can see here kind of how many we have to do. Um, wow, geez. There's and, actually heaps more comps on there than I thought. Yeah. Oh, no. So this, uh, we're going to go through this on the next one as well. It's very hard to compare commercials because you actually, it's not like for like, this one's a bit easier because you can find some small warehouses and try to get a feeling for square meter rates. But then each warehouse has different percentage of office space versus mezzanine area. So the numbers yeah. that are actually saying in terms of floor space isn't actually comparable. So it's a little bit more of a fine art there. Um, here's where exactly what I was talking about. We actually go through each of the comparables for rentals and look at who the tenant is, how long they've been there, um, what their circumstances are, floor areas, what... Electricity access, do they have three phase versus normal? Because on a cheap one, that's actually going to make a difference between whether you pay 250 or 350, which is a significant portion of the price. Um, so you yeah. want to match that up. And then we look wow. at it. So we choose the main comparables there. And that's the don't sue me, please. Guys. <laughs> the most important page is it, Steve? The, the photo of Polizzi, is it? Or? Yeah. All right. So cool. let's, let's get into it because I know we're pressed for time. This no, one. no, well, I'm not. I'm not too. I'm not too fresh. So, but before we get into this, this is going to be the meat, the absolute meat and toast. Let's. Um, I mean, let's let's pause. And I mean, we have to. We can't not. Um, we can't not play because you, you've even given us a special offer that I'd, I'd had to reread on this one. So um, I can yeah, let you talk to the special offer. So let's screen. let's take a break and and go and go and refill your cups and get yourself another beverage, people. Wait, I'll, Jeff, uh, did you just did you just tell people to leave? While you're playing my ad that I pay for, no, no, oh, okay, no, no, I, no, no, well, you can you can carry your phone around, yeah. I mean, uh, Joe does this much better than what I do, <laughs> anyway. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play this thing and figure out how to, yeah, I've got to share my screen again. Here we go. So, thanks for your patience, everybody. Thank you for your patience, and and watch and tell, tell me what you think of the ad. So, make sure you're not um, going to the bathroom. Commercial property offers the highest cash flow in Australian property investing, offering exceptionally higher yields than residential. Now we're talking eight to ten percent net yields. That's cash after all expenses, not this two to six percent gross that we see in the residential space. So mm. for those that are starting out on their commercial investing journey, it can be exciting, but it's also a step not to be taken lightly. 
The expertise of a commercial buyer's agent can pay dividends to help you secure that high cash flow and high growth potential property. And this is why we recommend Steve Polisi of Polisi Property. With over six years experience in the space, Steve has over 1,200 property transactions under his belt. He has seen it all and knows the best locations right for growth. In a previous life, Steve was a chartered mechanical and structural engineer. So he draws on his mathematical and analytical skills that he's developed to break down what works best in commercial property. As with engineering, same goes with commercial property. It's based primarily on the numbers. So if you're curious about diversifying into commercial property, you have access to $100,000 in cash or in equity, book a call with Steve today and find that perfect asset for you. I think I think we need to update that. Uh, I think we need to update the video because you, you've got you've got the you haven't got the blonde tips in there. It's so a, I mean, we I need love to the video. That oh, this, it's just a new level of arrogance of paying for an ad while I'm being interviewed on the segment. <laughs> I can't can't get any more arrogant. <laughs> no, that's, so there's, there's been some, and and um, you've actually given a given an offer that you. I was realizing uh, you 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 you've got a giveaway on your book. So what's the um, what's the thing that you're giving to you've you've managed to you want to sort of give to the give to the group to oh, the so end of this any, week? Any of you guys want free book? Just go to my website and use the code word OzProp, and you'll get a free copy of this bad boy. Yeah, I ha I had to actually update my uh, my comment because I had it at fifty percent. So it's only till this Friday. So you still have to pay postage though, right? Which, I mean, I think yeah, that's, so that's okay. I mean, well, whatever the post yeah, is. Yeah. Only like 35 bucks a book? They are. They yeah. Are. yeah, right. Yeah. What a saving, Todd. Free pair of stakes. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's, that's just really great. I was actually, I was reading through it again and I think I'm up to about, yeah, I'm up to about 75% through. And it's funny when you read a book for the second or third time and it, and I can see Todd's, some Todd's books there as well. He's got police in the background yeah, beside yeah. his own book. Go, go, yeah, yeah. go and get go and get your book top. And, um, and by the the renovator, the thing that you made of Sylvester Stallone with my face. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, we sent that to you. Like yeah, yeah. That's yeah. That was that was Joe's idea, I think. But uh, I was like, yeah, that sounds like a bloody good idea, Joe. Let's get it done. Um, but no, it's funny the things you pick up when you read things the second and third time. It's it's just like when I was reading, it, my eyes were glazing over. So let's get into the the uh, really exciting do uh, the case study acquisition one. Um, yeah. So talk us through this one, Polizzi. All right, let me share the magic screen. I think. All right, let's just give it a little bit. Here we low. go. We're on. Ah, oh, so this is actually an Ozprop members property that we have just kind of settled on. Um, not mine, not yet. Not not yours. So this one's an interesting. So normally, when you're looking for a property, you find the real commercial ad. You get it. The first thing you request is the IM. So this is the IM. Um, this generally the inform information memorandum. Correct. Just a, so yep. this one just gives you just a general overview of the property and kind of what the features are and things like that. Don't take any of these numbers for granted though. Like they're not, they, they're hopefully correct, but you need to cross check every single figure in them because just because an agent wrote it down doesn't mean it's actually the property. So just be mindful of that, but it's a good starting point to start your negotiations. So this property, the reason I chose it is because it's actually an all in one. So you've actually got a boxing gym um, you've got escape rooms, if you know what that is. And then the top floor is an office suite. Um, but then the property, because of the boxing gym and the escape room, it's actually a warehouse as well. So you've actually got two warehouses out the back that are there. That's the old photo, but it's now fitted out. So it's actually an all-in-one. In addition, we've got telecommunication towers on top that they also get. You love your telecommunication towers, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. So I actually had a conversation a couple of days ago about with the, the client for this. He's just been offered a million dollars for the roof space. What? This is a, this is a free insane. purchase. So we're trying to, he's trying to work out with the, the operators. Basically, American companies are coming in and buying out roof space and telecommunications. So he's, mm -hmm. he's loving life at the moment. He's going down that rabbit hole of uh, best lease. Does he do a 25 year, 50 year, 100 year lease and all things like that? But he's got to be mindful as well because if he ever wants to redevelop this property, that plays in a part. So they can be very, very lucrative and it's a it's an art form itself. So he's actually more well versed now in telecommunications than I am because he's just been reading contracts, he's been playing competitors off against each other. Um, but again, just a nice little value add. So can so, I just quickly ask then, Steve? So the, the leases that are already on those telecommunications towers there, they obviously had had expired, or, no, or how come yeah, he's going we're, down? We're still going for those. I think we've got till 2023. 
Um, so right. they'll either take it over afterwards or they'll just buy out the lease. So they'll just kind gotcha. of they'll sublease it so, out in the meantime and go from there. So when you're saying a million dollars, you mean that to sell those things, they would be worth or could be worth up to a million dollars? What's yeah, well, so it's not selling. He's selling the, the, the lease effectively. So it might be like it depends uh, on whether he sells it to him for 20 years or 100 years is mm. the price that he'll actually get. Um, okay. But it just goes down a three mil property getting a million dollars over, say, the next 20 years. Quite, yeah. quite lucrative for something that's not even the bare bone. I would have bought this property without them. So um, that's, that's something to keep mindful as well. You've got the same thing with like solar panels that you could do as well and make a little bit more money. So just get that added versatility there by having kind of a big freestanding building. Mm. Um, I, I want I want to take us back to the, the show, show us a, show us an, if you go down to the numbers part. Um, how, how do you you said it's important to cross reference cross check these? What, what is the best way to to actually do that? Yep. So we'll we'll go through that in the due diligence report. It's just okay. verify every single number. So any of the rent, cross check it with the lease, then yep. cross check it with the the rental ledger. So actually see what mm. the, the the tenants paying into a bank account. Uh, yeah. And then the square meter rates get title, floor space diagrams, uh, council certificates, all that type of stuff. So just go through all these numbers. This is just a nice starting point. A lot of the times you actually find these numbers wrong. So you might find the rent that you're receiving, they've given a, the rent's gone up or it's gone down. If it's gone down and part of due diligence, you find the numbers don't reflect it. You can then go back and hopefully renegotiate the price based on the net yield that it's actually giving, not the one that was advertised. So just you just go through all that. So You'll get that at the start. And then what I move into after that, so you can see it's 196 grand income on a three, we got it for $3 million flat, which so not a bad return. I think it's about 6.6% net return. Uh, but we'll go through the location. Also. You'll see it's, it's an awesome location. But first thing we'll go through is I have a quick look at the cash flow. So we'll go yep. $3 million, 197 grand rent. Uh, we get about six to 12 grand depreciation back at tax time, this one, but we can add that or take that away. It's not a big deal. Property management, we're getting about 4% for, for this size of asset. So at a 2.5% interest rate, you're getting 197 grand and you've got 52 grand worth of interest repayments on the loan. And you've got rental management at about 8,000. Tenants pay council rates, water rates, maintenance around the block. So it's 145 grand a year positive. So when, when you get clients that like want to buy a residential for two, three million dollars, and we talk about the quotes that we used at the start about like living life in your terms and having passive income, if you're happy not living in the house that you want to buy, you can actually retire very easily if you buy something like this. And it is low, lower risk because you've actually got five tenants effectively, or six, because there's two telecommunications contracts. Um, it is slightly lower risk because if you lose one, that just drops from 145,000 down to say $110,000 for that year. And even if you've got an 100% lend, like if you're pulling out equity to actually fund yeah. your deposit, you're still looking at what's that 122,000 passive. Yeah, this is the argument I had with a, with a client on Monday where they said they wanted to buy a $2 million house in Sydney that was about 10 grand a year negative. And they said, our oh, commercial's too high risk. And then they, they actually said, strangely enough, what happens if interest rates go up, you'll be stuffed. And I'm like, wait, you're buying a <laughs> negative property and you're telling me if interest rates go up, I'll be stuffed. So let's have a look. 70% loan at 6% interest rates, you still have a passive income. So, oh, so that, that is how you mitigate risk with a commercial property. Obviously, if you go out and you buy something silly like a mining town and it's a fabrication workshop and the mine closes and it sits there vacant for the next 10 years, that's a silly purchase. But this is, this is a property that's in Perth CBD. I think it's about 1.5, two kilometers from the actual center of the CBD. That's what we call kind of the, the blue chip location in quotation marks. So I'll have a look at that just to go, cool, what yield, what return we're getting, just cross-check the outgoings, just to make sure that's what, what I'm doing is kind of right. So we'll have a look at that. Then I'll have a quick look at the pay down because depending on the client's strategy, how quickly would this property pay itself off at the, the yield that we're getting? So same thing. So this is basically if you're paying P&I, or you're putting that $145,000 passive income back into the debt. And you'll see after 10 years, property becomes debt-free. And then just with 3% rental increases, you're actually going to have a 260 grand passive income for the rest of your life. So this, again, you can buy high-risk commercial. You can also buy very, very low risk. Say, say all the tenants leave 
in five, six, seven years, you're actually only got a eight hundred thousand dollar debt. So you've you've actually mitigated. If you can afford that, you're you're going to be okay financially. So it's just about balancing what lease terms you're getting, where you're buying, what you're buying. But this this is the type of thing that blows my head back. Like people in the group are going to have a three million dollar resi portfolio and zero passive income. So sometimes negative. Sometimes it's because they'll be buying kind of neutrally geared properties and re-leveraging them. They'll have zero. So instead of having a three mil resi portfolio with nothing to show for it besides a bit of capital growth aspects, you could literally retire in 10 years on a 250, 260 grand passive income. So that's that was kind of my light bulb moment with commercial. So have a quick look at that. The next one we'll look at is, I think I had an ROI calculator. Probably, probably the only, the, oh, sorry, you go, Todd. I was going to say the, the only challenge, I suppose, is is I got I got to find probably about nine hundred thousand dollars. But um, I mean, I, well, I suppose that's that's the. I mean, you still have to find it if you're going to buy a three million dollar resi portfolio. Anyway, you'd need to find I don't know. Let's say let's call it six hundred thousand, six or seven. So it's not you got to find deposits from somewhere. You, you really can actually get eighty percent loans at the moment with commercial with like ANZ at the moment are doing two point eight percent thirty year mortgages P and I. So there, there's stuff like that that comes up. So that. That brings it more on par of residential. Um, yeah. Again, it's just about assessing kind of what you're trying to achieve versus what your serviceability is. I'm just using this example just because it shows, it actually shows a passive income that blows people's mind and they'd be happy to live off the rest of their life. So it Probably, is, yeah. yeah, it's just a bit of a game changer. So what, what was is, your question, Tom? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I was just going to ask, um, uh, actually, what was I going to ask? Oh, sorry. Sorry, mate. I've started reading this now. and My mind's gone elsewhere. <laughs> so if it comes back to me, I'll ask. Yeah. So yeah, this on. is this is just a quick check, just to see kind of what ROI is. So that way, because a lot of, especially the high net worth investors, they're trying to decide whether to buy a commercial or shares and things like that. So they actually they actually don't care about net returns. They actually care about the ROI because if they're putting money in shares, they want to see what the return is versus. So this would just look at. Cool. The cash that you needed to buy the property is about a million dollars. So that's the 30% deposit, stamp duties, purchasing costs, things like that. And they're getting 197 grand rent, which is 150 grand cash flow, as we said before. So they're, they're 150 grand over the million dollars they put into it. It's about a 15% return cash on cash, which is not a bad return. Most shares kind of perform 7 to 15%. Um, so you, you're kind of on par with them. Then if you throw capital growth, into the mix, if you get 5% capital growth on the 3 million, you then start looking at a 30% ROI, which is very, very positive. Mm. I just remembered my question. Um, so when we were talking before about lease stock loans, you and I were chatting the other day, like off air, is this something that you could get in there where like you've got someone that maybe has access to a lot of equity, like Jeff was saying before, if you're chucking a 30% deposit, you're needing 900 grand to sort of pull this together. But let's say, yeah, your serviceability is just shot. Is, is this this is the kind of asset that you could go, it doesn't matter, I'll let the lease service the loan? Yes. So so most of the time when people run into serviceability issues with commercial, they'll then shift into lease stock loans where the strength of the lease is kind of where they get the borrowing capacity for. And so like, like me personally, I, I buy under lease stock loans because I've got quite a large resi portfolio. So it just means I can be fine. This one would be a very complicated lease stock loan because lease Why's stock that? loans, well, there's there's six different leases on it. So, uh, yeah, it so, so trying, to, trying to work with the banks, it's, it's going to be, it, it's doable. What they'll do is they'll work at the well, spot on Jeff. So they'll work at the well between the leases and then they'll go, you kind of use that. Um, not, not impossible, but just a bit more kind of moving parts there. Okay. Um, yeah. It, the, the, the type of loan doesn't affect too much with the quality of the purchase that I make. The only difference is if I am getting someone who's using the lease stock loan, I won't, I won't find something on a short lease. And I know people are going to say, oh, don't you want everything on a long lease? Not necessarily. Sometimes you actually want a, a lease renewal because they might be paying under market rent and you actually want to bump it up. Or you, you pick up a bit of a bargain because um, it's only got 12 or 18 months left on the lease. So that actually gets rid of some of the buyers. But then part of my due diligence is I actually speak with the tenant. So they might actually say, no, no, we're definitely keen to sign the next lease. And then all of a sudden I've got something on an 18 month lease and they're signing the next three or five year lease as well. So I'm actually getting a better deal by buying something on a shorter lease. Mm. So you're just kind increasing the risk a little bit. Yeah, you are. But for me, I'm looking long-term on a property. So whether the tenant leaves in 18 months time or three years time, 
you're going to be in the same situation anyway. So, and I have the same argument with residential. People go, oh, I want something on a 12 month lease to, to get it. Who cares if they leave in six months, 12 months, or 18 months? You, it still needs to have low vacancy rates. Otherwise, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Um, this one, the, the tenant interview about their long term kind of prospects is actually more important. So, we'll kind of run through. Um, I gave you a quick summary before of kind of things we checked, but we'll just kind of go through one piece at a time just so you can ask questions. Um, this is just an overview of the kind of area, what we're buying, things like that. Um, some photos that probably you can see that we've actually got two warehouses out the back. I like that even though we've got a tenanted property, it just gives us versatility in the future because if the tenants ever leave, we can then like split up the tenancies or kind of turn it into a more industrial type asset. You've got a big car park out the front and a car park out the back, so it gives you kind of lay down areas as well. Um, mm -hmm. and just, just gives you options. So these are old photos. It's all fitted out now. It's just because they're core logic photos. All right, so this is the basically information on the IM, just to summary of the property, and we cross-check this to make sure we're happy with everything. All right, so this, this is the location we're talking about. So we're, we're basically about, a, what was it, uh, two kilometres, two kilometres from Perth CBD. So we're literally bang there on the map next to Perth CBD. So cracker of a location for a 6.6% net yield. And then we just, we just do some just spot checks. So you can look at where the arterial roads are, how much road traffic that area is getting, um, location to ports and airports, um, train stations, you do all that kind of thing. Um, this one's quite important, walking from, from the train station. So cool. Yeah, are these businesses, yeah, other businesses are going to be able to get staff, but this one's double bonus because you actually got car spots as well as being near a train station. So Ticks that you're, so, you're, you're so right near Optus Stadium. So pe people go to a skate room and go and watch the uh, West Coast Eagles. Um, I mean, I yeah, be get beaten by the Sydney Swans when we go over there. Yeah, and again, gives you options in the future. Like I said, with the warehouses, you could turn it into like, again, with council approval and things like that, like a cool brewery or something like that. They're popping up quite a lot in the industrial yes, areas. Yeah. In so there's an option there. Similar to residential, cool. we check the zoning and we see what's permissible there. So little bit more complicated here with commercial. It's not just, cool, is it a residential property and can you do apartments or dual dwellings or whatever it is? You basically get specifications from the council of what's allowed and what's not allowed. You can still yep. apply for permission even if it's not on the list. So basically you've got all these different types of industry for commercial, whether they're permissible or not allowed and things like that. So just I'll give you an idea of the legend. Uh, where is it? Du, du, du. It's normally in here. Yeah, what's A and D and X? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's zonings. Oh, there you go. It's on the top, top left. Is, is it top left? Where is it? They normally throw it in. Uh, so, you yep, P you yep. so it's permitted. P is permitted. Um, our A, which is annoying because it's like, I always think allowed, but it means not not allowed effectively. Um, and then you've got all that kind oh, of mix there. It's a bit weird. Then in addition to that, when you're actually checking whether the businesses are allowed, some of them actually need permission from the council in particular. I think this one from memory, we'll get through it in the report. I think it was the boxing gym um, needed permission. The office spaces were fine and the escape room was fine. Um, so yep. you've got to register the leases as well with council. So you're checking there. So that's that's something that kind of confuses a lot of people with what's allowed, what's not allowed. Um, not as critical when you're buying it, but more if you're releasing it about what permit is use. But again, you need to check that basically the what's in there is allowed because you don't want to get to the point where you buy the property, then all of a sudden you get a knock on the door from council and they say, no, your, your tenant's not allowed. And they get kicked out. Then you're in a in a bit of a, a bit of a fight with the tenant about who's going to cover your bond and all that type of stuff. So best is to avoid. So you go yeah. through that. Um, every council's got their own like their own legends and basically forms and stuff you've got to go through. It's absolute horrible part of the due diligence, but worth checking. Um, same thing for zoning. You just want to check kind of what the zoning is uh, for the types of buildings that are allowed. Check all the legends and things like that. I won't focus too much on that because it's a rabbit hole you can kind of spend five hours on. Um, if you're in doubt as well, I recommend actually calling a local town planner because they they can explain everything to you. They'll, they'll run you through. And they know, especially if it's local, they'll know exactly what's going on there. Most of the time, I actually find out from the town planner about a future development before I actually find it online. Like you can go on council websites. So it's called PD online for most council websites. So it's property development. Um, you'll find out kind of what applications are in place, but town planners know off the top of the head. It's literally their bread and butter. They're, they're the development guys, the, the white collar desk development guys. So 
have a chat with them, run through kind of you buying this property, what's achievable. Similar to like my, my cafe, they kind of tell you what they think is kind of going to work on the block in the area, things like that. So go through all the zoning, um, do the big ticket overlay checks, obviously as well, like flood, fire, all that type of stuff. So this way you can see well out of the, the flood zone. Um, this is just a river that's running through, so it's not not too critical. Um, but obviously, just to, uh, just to jump, just to jump in here, um, there's uh, I'm sure plenty of people want to ask questions. There is a giveaway, and I, I, I think I picked one, maybe two um, people that I've already sort of seen. Um, but yeah, throw throw in your questions, and it, I mean, definitely ask because uh, Steve's absolutely going super deep here. Um, I mean, literally, there's a river going through this um, <laughs> around the sort of yeah. But yeah, we, and the giveaway is uh, free or, or this free strategy sessions with um, with with um, property, what is it, game plans to... Um, so we'll, you, we'll use the game plan software. So that, that obviously yep. costs a couple of grand. So I'll, I'll shout you that and then we'll do the strategy with you. So we'll work out a, a 10, 15, 20 year strategy, whether residential or commercial is right for you. And we'll just work backwards from your goals and go from there. So a couple of grand yeah. worth of kind of value that I'll, I'll, I'll shout you. Yeah. But you go on. So we've got services. Oh, jeez. Right. Is- so so you, you do this with residential. This isn't, this isn't groundbreaking stuff pun intended. Um, you just look at kind of what's possible. Not as critical if you're buying like the little 300K warehouse I showed you, but if you're going to do a future development, this this could obviously be quite important for, for the commercial property. So same thing as Resi. You just check sewer access, power, um, what the supplied water lines are and drainage and all that type of stuff. So have a look at that. You get that from um, Dial Before You Dig is generally the, most, the way most people do it. So get, yep. get an account with Dial before you dig and look up that stuff, get the diagrams. Sometimes the, the real estate agents will give you all this stuff up front, which makes it easy as well. Um, try to get as many floor plans as you can. And sometimes you, you can get them, sometimes you can't. It'll just, you just see with like, you see this one's just quite drawing. Um, this one's for the escape room. I know this is the, the gym. So I've just done a sketch there. Again, you can check the floor meters by them giving you the sketch. You go, cool. When you actually measure the building, when you do your building and pest, cross-check it with the number of the, the drawing that you've got with what the actual agents presented with what's actually on core logic as well. So you've actually got three or four checks mm-hmm. there just so we can do. Um, this is just the ground floor one. All right. So this is, this is where we get into the tenants. So we actually kind of cross start cross-checking what's on their lease versus what they're actually paying. And th- this is where it will get complicated when you've got lots of tenants because nothing ever lines up perfectly. Like you'll always get something where they might have a bill and they pay something a month later or before, or they've given them a rental concession for a month during COVID. Or for instance, um, uh, the escape rooms, they actually only signed on uh, 20, uh, 2021. So they're a new business. So they actually had three months uh, rental concession at the start of their lease that you need to double check um, and then speak with all the tenants, obviously. So I summarize it for clients and then we go through each of the leases and cross-check all the figures, cross-check it with the floor space because in the lease as well, it'll also give you the floor space. So there's another additional check you can cross-check things off and if you find any discrepancies, ask. Go back to the agent, find out, get them to cross-check it. Uh, there's the leases and the floor. So. All right, tenancy mix. This one's more important, I'd say, for like if you're buying a uh, that like the 300k warehouse where you want to see in the comp in the complex what are the other tenants doing that'll give you an indication of the type of kind of business that they're in in terms of where are they servicing so if you go to like an industrial complex and there's a kitchen fabricator there's a mechanic there's a spray painter there's a nuts and bolts supplier things like that you know that that's that's generally like a service based area whereas if you go in and there's just five different types of distributors and storage, things like that, you know, okay, they're probably not servicing the local area. They're probably more of a distribution type kind of complex. So it'll just give you a feel for the area that you're kind of looking at. Um, and do you look at that because like weighing up, is there a likelihood of them them leaving if other options come up or why do you yeah, do that? So, so it'll just it'll let you, give you a kind of starting points to go down the rabbit hole of, okay, if they ever leave, what type of tenant can I get? Ideally, like a really good mix in an industrial complex would be a, a good one to look at because if you do have the, the panel beater and then you've got a distributor, then you know, okay, if these tenants ever leave, I get to advertise to the whole market. So you've actually got a, a bigger pool of businesses to look at. But again, it, it's going to depend what you buy. And if you buy an industrial complex right next to 
say an airport or a port, cool, that's most likely going to be a distribution-based business. If it's an industrial complex surrounded by residential properties, most mm. likely going to be a service-based business that's going to fit out. And that'll come into play as well when you're looking at the type of mix between the floor space in the industrial versus the office space versus the mezzanine area as well. Then how heavy industry you need as well, whether you need overhead cranes or how big the roller door has got to be. If you need an industrial that has a entry and exit door, because if it's a distribution one, you want them coming and going really quickly. So having two doors means they can get freight in and out much more faster. And this is, this is what we're talking about at the start of the conversation, guys. Every commercial different, every area is different, every type of asset is different as well. And you just the best thing, knowledge is power. If you can get your head around most aspects of it, you're just putting yourself with the best chance of having a good long-term performing property. Whereas if you just go and just kind of roll the dice and go, oh, yeah, I'm buying something, it should be right in 20 years because there's no oversupply in the area. Cool, you probably still will do all right. But for me, knowing more is power. So at what yeah. stage, if you normally put like a due diligence clause in the contract, are you doing any of this after contract or this is all before it? No, no. So this is all after contract. Basically, all the after. thing we're doing before we go into contract, if it's a due diligence clause, checking yep. the price um, and checking comparable rents is the main one. I'll do a high level of this stuff. Like I'll obviously go on Google Maps and things, but I'll do all of this after thing. The the market's so hot, Todd, you you yep. have to get under contract as quick as possible. If you, gotcha. if you dick about for three, four days, you're going to lose this deal. Like this one, we went under contract within 24 hours. Um, yep. You need That's, to... Um, what sort of due diligence clause can, have, have you been able to, or do you, have you a standard one or what sort yeah, of period? In, in the past, two, three years ago, 14, 21 days, very normal. Now, yeah. because there's so many offers and so many cash unconditional offers, I'm trying to shorten that. Normally it's 14 um, with the relationships that the agent's got. Seven, if we do get a seven one, we'll just kind of smash those as much due diligence as we can. If we're short or the agent doesn't give us the information we need, we can always request an extension. So you can request an extension. If they say no, which they rarely do, it's probably one in 20 times they say no, then you can crush a deal. Yeah. If you want the information you're happy with, you crush a deal. You might lose a little bit of money on building pest inspections and things like that. But in the grand scheme of things, dodging a bullet's way more valuable. So yeah, yeah I normally do seven to 14 days is a pretty normal one. Um, but again, I, I get a bit of a different, I get a bit of leeway from agents because they know my, my clients are serious. Like I'm not just someone who's inquired online. They know I vetted them. They've spoken to a broker. They've got basically a pre-approval or approval in principle. Um, I'm not wasting their time. Whereas some people will just go on a contract on three or four properties at a time and then choose the best one. So I, I get a weird level of respect just because I've purchased so many through so many agents. So, uh, but again, always have a due diligence to clause um, unless you're going to auction or you buy an unconditional, then you have to do all this up front. And then you run the risk of spending a week doing this type of information and losing out on the deal, but losing out on a bad deal is better than buying it. Mm. And, um, and just as a sales agent, not my, whilst I'm not a commercial property sales agent, Resi, what Steve's saying, I can totally back up as well. As soon as we know someone's working with a, a quality buyer's agent, there is a different level of, okay, th these people are ready to go. Otherwise, X buyer's agent wouldn't even be working with them. I've, I've I, this is going to sound bad. I might have like thrown you guys under the bus here. I've had ones where they've accepted our slightly lower offer because they know they're working with with a buyer's agent and they know they're serious. Whereas it, we were talking, there was about twenty grand difference, but they took our mm. offer just because there was more guarantee. And he told the actual owner this. He said, "Look, I'm working with the buyer's agent. I've worked with him twenty times before. Or I've got this guy who came off came off the internet. Um, do you want to go with the buyer's agent?" And he said, "Yes." And it's just because it mm. is a smoother relationship. Um, but again, I'm not, you don't have to use a buyer's agent. I, you can do all this. And this is why I'm showing you those property guys this. And I will put all this stuff free online. You can go through the checklist and sample reports. And you can do this yourself if you feel comfortable with. Um, but there, there obviously are some benefits to use a buyer's agent. Just the experience, I suppose. I mean, because I've, I've sort of picked up things here and there from reading your book and just having conversations. But uh, but yeah, I'd still imagine I'm about 1,000 steps or 500 steps behind Polizzi. Exactly. Yeah, it's the, you can get 90% of it by just doing all the stuff that I'm presenting here. The 10% the and the, the real value is in a buyer's agent is they've seen what can go wrong. So they're a bit more of an insurance policy for you because there's just tips and tricks that you can actually do. So like, um, actually one, one I had last week. So we need to actually request a finance extension and they actually said no, but we didn't have finance approved. So 
normally you'd just be like, you're not going to risk your deposit. If you basically don't make the finance clause um, or you don't get finance, they'll keep your deposit. So that was a, a really big call to make. Stuff like, so I actually just negotiated a five grand like retainer. So I said, look, how about we give you $5,000 if you give us our seven day due diligence, I'm oh, sorry, seven day finance extension. If we don't approve finance, that five grand is yours to keep. So that's a nice little incentive for you to trust us that we might get finance. If we don't get finance and we need to crash, you keep it. If we do, we get it back. And then that, that got it over the line. So it's just little tips and tricks like that, which the everyday investor is just not going to know is even possible. Hmm. Yeah, and you can't know what you don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. And I've just, just learned it over time. Like sometimes I've even made it up. Like I've just like that one. I know, <laughs> no, no one actually told me that. I, I've started doing it like quite a lot actually in the last 12 months. Um, because in a quiet market three years ago, you didn't have to do it. They always gave you the extension. Now that they're actually saying no, because a lot of the times when you've got a property under contract, the agent might get another offer that's higher, that's cash. So it's unconditional from the get-go. So you at some point need to kind of swing it their way. So I just made it up. I just threw it out there one day and the agent said, oh, great. Well, we'll get that done. I went, oh, that was easy. So, nice. yeah. Um, so similar about the tenant mix, um, you look at around the area as well. So you actually have a look at what other types of businesses are in the area. Again, this gives you some forecasting about what you could potentially do with the property in the future. Um, really, really important if you're doing retail as well. You want to see what type of mix of businesses are there, kind of where the foot traffic. And most of the time when you go on Google Maps, you'll actually see where they are. When you're typing like businesses, you'll see where they all pop up. So you actually know, okay, that's the main street. And then when you're doing your Google Street View, getting your property manager to drive around, uh, building pest inspector, when you're looking at the property, it'll give you an idea of kind of the things to look out for. Um, this is competition analysis. So this um, is basically, so cool, we're buying a boxing gym. What other types of gyms are in the area? And that'll give, that'll give you an idea of longevity or if there's an oversupply. Like if you're like buying an Anytime Fitness and you see that there's a Fitness First, there's a Plus Fitness, there's a Reds Fitness, and they're all within like a half, a 500 meter radius, you know it's going to be pretty competitive. You can go down the rabbit hole as far as you want. Like say it's a gym business, you can actually call their competitors and ask them how many members they have and then oh, work out, cool, are they successful businesses and things like that. But that's that's a much more important on a one-dimensional asset class because it's most likely going to stay that tenant for some time. So for the gyms, we did a competitor analysis. The office space, I didn't bother because I had a quick look at office, but Office is an office. It's some cubicle kind of chairs. That's more about kind of the industry as a whole, the economy, what types of business is going on, is it thriving, unemployment rates in the area and things like that. And then we'll go through just the, obviously the council facts. Um, I've got all this stuff for clients that I give them in a separate PDF, but I just summarize it in the report just so they get a feeling for the area that they're buying in. Um, so I've been in Highgate. The census, the census data comes out soon. Jeez. It's yeah. So out of date now. Yeah, it is. Um, all right, outgoing. So this is the trying to cross check the outgoings and a multi-tenancy is a lot harder because tenants pay a percentage of it. And that can be normal. It's normally dependent on what floor space they're using much easier. If you've just got like a multi-tenancy warehouse, because it's, it's, they're like for like, but this one, it's one is a top floor office. The other one's a skate room. The other one's an industrial slash gym. So you just got to cross check what's in the lease first, what percentage of the area you mentioned this before the whale. Jeff, yeah. so you can work out what the whale of the property is. So that's going to be what you use when you go to the bank. Um, this is just my due diligence support. There's all the other stuff as well that you'll go through. So you obviously do like the um, lease review with the solicitor. You get the body corporate reports if there's one. This one's freestanding, so it's a, a self-managed one. Um, you'll then do all the flood zone checks, um, council approval checks and all that type of stuff as well. This is just kind of summarizing it. So there's, there's more work than there's this, but this will give you a good overview. This one, like I said, got complicated. So we actually made a spreadsheet and actually tried to work out who's paying what, where the money's going. Uh -huh. then, then we had to cross-check it with the rental ledgers. So we actually went back over the last 24 months of what the tenants have actually put into a physical account, total it, Jeez. and looked at per month what they're paying, um, land tax as well, how that got split up. Again, we've got like a effectively a retail versus industrial versus office. So... This one was a, a kind of pull your hair out type one, but quite important for it because it's, it's going to affect your net result of the property. Cross-check all the council rates, water rates with the actual document. So like I said, don't just go off what the IM says. Get the physical document 
over the last 24 months and cross-check the numbers. Make sure the tenants paid it. Um, see where you are. And then so same thing for water rates, all those bills. This is where we kind of do a bit of a tenant analysis. So first things I do is go through and do a stalk, social media stalk, find out about as much about this, go to the website, see if they've got any ratings on Google, Facebook, Instagram, just get a general feel for the type of business. It'll help you when you do your tenant call as well. So when you actually call, um, this one I actually quite like, it was just a recruitment company. I think that'll do quite well in Perth in the next kind of five, 10 years. Um, mm. employment is the lowest it's almost ever been. So having recruiters and there's demand for jobs, people spending a lot of money over there in WA as well, the state government. I've just heard oh, it's just, like eight, billion. Or eight billion, yeah. is it? Yeah, something like uh, that, yeah. Certain industries, well, actually all industries, like the unemployment's so low, you've actually got a choice of jobs. So rec- all the mm. my mates that are recruiters, they're just like, they actually can't find staff. So businesses are going to recruiters to basically get people now because advertising is not enough and people are demanding higher salaries and but so general industry wise yep i like it as business but as a, it's, it's an office so i'm not actually caring as much because it is just some cubicle desks and people so it's, that i'd look at more of the economy as opposed to the business itself um the gym so this is the the muay thai mma gym um so we'll go through study them ego, yeah, so social media is kind of the big one for there. You can kind of see how how well they are. Because some some gyms, you know, like they're just old school. They're not up to date with how times are going. So they seem like they had a pretty good kind of following online, business, Google reviews, ratings and things like that, which is not bad for an MMA gym. They're normally kind of pretty bad at it. Like normally it's the, the franchise type gyms that really push it. Um, escape rooms, um, again, not a business that I understood how profitable they are or if they're not profitable and things like that. So you can request P&L statements. A lot of the times they won't actually give them to you and then you have to go off the rental ledger and what your phone conversation you have with them. Um, but this one, it's a new fit out, new lease. They've got plenty of kind of media support wow. and sponsors and things like that. So yeah, cool. again, it all, all kind of stacked up. Five-star review, 137 people. It was pretty pretty good for a business that's been there for a year. Mm. Um, and this is the tenant interview. So we'll go through. You can ask them as many questions as you want. This is just a summary. We ask them about 20, 30 questions, which um, in my book, um, you like, I've actually got the big list of all the questions I typically ask. But this one, because it's a bigger property, we just summarized it in the report. So just how long they've been at the property, how their business is actually traveling, um, how are they during COVID, do they like the location, um, are they happy with the lease terms? That's, that's a really important one. If yeah. they're happy or not happy, that's where you can get the little the little flag for, oh, I might be able to increase some value here. They might say, oh, we feel like we're paying a little bit too much rent, 5% too much rent. They might only have a year and a half left on it. You go, cool. If I reduce the rent by 5%, would you sign a fresh five-year lease? So look at opportunities like that. Um, this is another one as well. Are there any problems with the property? Um, they'll actually tell you most of the time, what's wrong with the property. So you can see here, there's a few roof leaks. So we actually went back and we got that fixed as part of settlement. The building and pest inspection will obviously think, but building and pest inspections can't find roof leaks unless it's raining. So they'll actually tell you, oh, cool, there's water pool in the, the common areas or the driveways. Um, are there any issues or cracks they're worried about or leaks and things like that? So that's quite important. Sometimes as well, you can work with the tenant. So you might actually notice that the sign out the front of the building is really run down and old. And you might actually say, hey, look, if I if I actually, I don't know, build a brand new billboard for you, um, would you pay a little bit more rent or things like that? So you can look for those opportunities. But main thing is just to make sure that they're a good long-term tenant and what their relationship is like with their current property manager. Um, that'll, that'll give you a lot of kind of things moving forward. But most of these chats, we end up having a bit of a chin wag on the phone for about half hour or an hour because you ask them about the industry as a whole, if they have they considered buying the property themselves or are they going to move and things like that. So they're, they're actually really fun chats to have because you get the, the business side of the thing, not the property side. Mm. Yeah, we're, we're, we're um, I mean, so, so many, I should, we should have gotten into this earlier because we're, we've got heaps of questions and, and we're at an hour and a half. I just want to, do you want to give us a quick kind of five yep. minutes? Uh, I know we... Oh. Well, we'll go through. We're, we're pretty much there anyway. So this is what I mentioned before about rental ledgers. Cross-check all the all the figures of what's going in and out of the owner's bank account. 
Um, council approvals, that's obviously checking that they, what they're, they're currently there, they're allowed to do. ABN checks, so check the tenant's actual credit history as well. So you can actually do you can actually do a credit history search on the actual owners of the businesses if you like. Yeah, that's, that's important. Yeah, see their, their general kind of ABN. So you actually see, sometimes you see when they change names and you can query on the phone call with them why they change business names and things like that. Um, then we've got insurance. So you've got to check the tenant's insurance. So most of them they'll need public indemnity. Then you check the building insurance, um, things like that. So you just cross-check. Speak with an insurance company or an insurance broker and find out that, cool, that actually insurance is actually valid because sometimes certain types of buildings or locations um, or flood zones and that, you won't actually be covered even if they have insurance. Um, so go through, read all those certificate currency. That's basically an insurance certificate for the building and what's covered. Um, comparable sales. I mean, I'll go over this quickly so you generally get an idea of it, but this is the hard one because it's office space, it's industrial, it's retail. What are you actually comparing to? There's, there's not much like for like. So this one, we just chose as many as we could and we just kind of amortized all of them and looked at some residential. We looked at some office space. We looked at some retail. <laughs> Try to get an idea for sale rates and rental rates for all the different types. And then we can kind of cross-check it with the square meter rates, what we're doing. But you can just see here, main comparable sales. We chose some on the same street, some industrials, previous sold history of everything in the area. And like I said, we, we looked at everything, what they kind of do. There's quite a lot here. Um, rental comparison, same thing. And I mentioned on the last one, you actually go through and actually, once you found a comparison, look at the actual details, look at what their fit out is, who the tenant is, how long the lease terms are, what the mezzanine area to office space ratio is. So that way you get a bit more of a tangible number for the square meter rates. You can see they vary between like 120 and 80 um, or even 180 there. So we'll choose somewhere in the middle just as a nice conservative figure. Go through all the comparable. This one's bigger than usual, guys, just FYI, just because we obviously got four different types of tenants. Um, look at where the comparables are. Comparable rentals. Um, this is not like Resi where you just go on real commercial because sometimes there's actually only one or two comparables. Go on CoreLogic, look at the comparables, look at their old sales campaigns and talk to property managers on the ground. That's where you get the figures. There's no auto val for rentals here. So... Just go through and choose as many as you can just to get a feeling for it. Vacancy is another hard one. You can't just duck across to SQM and look up what the vacancy period is. You go through, speak to property managers, find how long leasing campaigns were, find as many comparables as you can. This is the, the gut work that you have to do. Like that's four or five hours in itself just checking vacancies. Go through it and don't sue me at the end of the process, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's some... Um... We, we, yeah, there's, uh, you could even do like you could even probably do a five-hour session on that was um that, that, that was comprehensive and I, what do you, you have any questions there? Quick questions there, Todd? Because I know before I, I I'm going to jump into some questions myself from the audience. No questions, man. Just just the statement of I don't know how anyone does that without a BA. If you've never bought commercial property before, like yeah, that that just seems like there's so many different things that you could do wrong without even knowing you're doing them wrong. None of them's illogical. It's all when I kind of show you, it all it all makes sense. But you just have to do the work, and like you said, you have to yeah. know that you have to do the work. You you can't be lazy. I, I get a lot of people that say, "Oh, can I find my own commercial property and get a reduced commission?" Then, or if you ever, I've said yes this once in the past, and they just send you ten real commercial ads every single day, and you're like, "Okay, that's that's the easy part." <laughs> do you want to maybe do something a bit more substantial before you send it to me? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, great. Well, let's let's hop into some some questions, and I, that, this this is one specific. So, people remember we still have um, so throwing. I'm, I'm going to have to. I won't be able to probably answer all these, but we'll get to as many as we can. Keep keep them coming. We'll probably go for. We can do, um, Jeff. We can do a what would Steve do? So only the questions we don't there get to. Let's, let's tally them up, and I'll do a what would Steve do next week. You can. So this one, um, you're going to do it next week. G committing. One for, so this property was offered on market. Does that mean there's more availability for more competition? Um, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yes and no. So there's mm. um, that, that property is in a bit of a price range where there's not so many of the armchair investors just having a look. Like sub yeah. million now, it's a feeding frenzy. Like spoke with an agent last weekend and put a 500 grand property online, had 80 inquiries in the first hour. So <laughs> So he, he actually ended up selling it to me because he's like, I don't want to deal with his inquiry, Steve. Just give me a good fair market price. So 
Off market doesn't mean better value anymore. It used to three, four years ago. And any buyer's agent kind of spelling that they're off market, we're getting you below market. People aren't idiots. They know it's a hot market. You will probably pay fair market rate. So the, the art of commercial investing at the moment is not so much what price you get. Because who, who actually cares if I pay three million and fifty thousand for that property or two million nine hundred thousand and fifty thousand when you get a hundred and fifty grand a year cash flow in three four months time you're actually on par with it so all that due diligence that i showed you is actually more important than the actual purchase price so to answer his question yes there's more competition but that actually doesn't mean you get a better better value property yeah i think that's the hard thing to wrap your head around really isn't it actually going oh wait a second it doesn't matter as much if I actually pay that little bit extra, but securing the deal is really the win in this market or the deal where the numbers work, where you've done everything and, right in and the due diligence. The short term it is as well, let alone long term. If their property is worth 6 million in 10 years time, who cares about the 50,000? Um, mm. And again, you look at, if say, say that we, we said no to that property because it was $50,000 more and it took mm. me three, four months to find the, the client another property, he's actually in a worse position now. Mm. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah, just wanted to give a um, yeah, you, everybody's loving your mic and and your attention to detail. So there's no there's no comments on on what Jeff's doing. Jeff's just uh, playing playing fumbling his way through the uh, through the sponsors. But um, <laughs> sorry, yeah. This this I thought was an interesting one on that kind of um, a, a frenzy um, because somebody sort of said this is from Nathan who I don't know I think he I feel like he he's chatted to you before maybe Nathan Smith. Um, but he said, "Do you think do you think superannuation is ruining commercial market? Um, there's there's such little properties available in the areas that they want. Seems like all these property or, or all these all these people buy properties in their supers just and just hold them for eternity. Um, I mean, I, I think that's been the way for quite some time, hasn't it, Steve? Like, what's what's your thought on? I mean, yeah, it's a big so question, I know. Yeah, so that that's actually helping commercial properties grow. Um, sorry, sorry, Nathan, life's not fair. Um, if the people that already own <laughs> People that already own commercial properties are loving that it's a hot market. Same as residential. Mm. People trying to get into it are hating it. People that own already that are making lots of money doing well. We don't get to complain when the markets grow in value because that's why we buy property. If they didn't grow, we wouldn't even be having this discussion. So you just need to shift, shift your focus. Yes, it's not nice that there's less market properties on the market. Tough. Yep. What are you going to do about it? Try to get in some other way. Go slightly more regional, lower price point. Do a value add project. Don't buy a property. Go go buy Bitcoin. Whatever, whatever you want to decide. Not financial advice. Do Definitely something. Not. You, you have to do something. The thing I like about property is once you're in, you're in. You've got something you can leverage off. And all, all of us three here, we've all done well because the market's moved. We've leveraged our mm. first property, and that's got us in. And it get, gets easier and easier as time moves on. But you just you just shift. Yep, commercial moves, residential moves. I was buying quite a lot of properties in Brisbane for clients, residential, two years ago. The market's moved 30 40%. I'm buying less. Cool. We're shifting to other locations. We're looking at Townsville's and the Bendigo's and the, the lifestyle regions. Shift and adjust your, your, your way you do things. Yeah. Mm. I've been interested in your thoughts on, on uh, Todd being a sales agent, but also having recently done a reno project. Was that a reno that you bought or what was I mean? Um, yes. Yeah, reno that I bought. Um, so I bought that one. That was on market. Um, but it's uh, the question's kind of perfectly positioned because we actually just released an episode today with Steve about um, the increase in purchases on self-managed super funds. Yeah, no, I didn't want to wow. say that. Okay, yeah, because I, I saw that and I was like, I want because I, 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 I'm probably a couple of months behind. I, I normally, I'll go and sort of see who, who the interviews are. I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll look forward to that one in, in three months' time when I listen to it, but I'm, yeah, I'm behind. No, the, <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the Renault project that I just did was just a, a simple there was money in it. I, I'd actually sold something. Mean, this is a great sort of testament to understanding, sorry, not understanding, having good relationships with agents in your area as well. Because yep. I'd sold a property in the same complex for 321 and they were asking uh, 220 to 240 for this unit. And I knew it was only going to cost me about 15, 20 grand to renovate it. So wow. long story short, I got it for 225, just had it revalued the other day for 325 and made 70 odd grand out of a quick little three month turnaround and just got at least yesterday by Pru actually no the tenants moved in today Pru Muirhead for four hundred dollars a week so i think it's Jeez. 120 bucks a week positive cash flow or something like that nice there you go maybe yeah. you have to this sort of circles back to nathan's one as well if you can't afford to get in the market or you're missing on deals 
cool. Look at something a bit different. Do what do what Toddy did. Get in a little bit, get a little bit extra. So you can pay that extra fifty thousand dollars in for the commercial that you want. Because in ten years' time, like I said, it's insignificant in the grand scheme of things. Focus on the quality and get into the market. Yeah, and I think like the deals that you were doing five years ago, you might not be able to do now. It's the same way if you read Steve McKnight's book, Zero to Two Sixty in Seven Years. Good luck replicating any of those strategies. Doesn't mean it's not a great book and it's, there's not a lot you can still take from it. But if Steve was to jump into the market right now, there's no way he's doing what he was doing 20 years ago when he was buying. Not in, not in, probably not in Australia at least, but we, we are going to get to see one here one of these days. I mean, we, we, we've, Joe and I were both mentored by him, so, or somewhat sort of group well, mentors. It doesn't matter, Jeff. You've got the Steve. <laughs> he well, yeah, yeah. go, he hasn't got blonde tips I'll, I'll give you that um let, let's get back into the question so I, I this is an interesting one i thought because do you prefer it if clients because this kind of talks to the team so i think this is a holistic kind of smart thinking um person sort of saying have you engaged a, a broker prior to engaging or sorry of speaking to a ba or do you recommend a commercial broker like what are your thoughts on that yeah, so it's probably only, surprisingly only about one in five people come to me having spoken to a broker. Most of them are that second part of that question. They come to me and they say, oh, do you have a good commercial broker? And then I recommend my, my guys. I've got a few guys that I recommend. Quite a lot of them, they're actually in the, the Oz Property Group. So you, you, you know who you are. So I'll, yeah. I'll recommend them out there. The reason I don't actually necessarily want them to have engaged a broker prior to me is because most of the time they'll talk to their resi broker and their resi broker will, they don't want to miss out on a commission. So they'll just kind of go, oh, yeah, I can get you a commercial deal. And they'll go to the big four lenders. They're not experienced enough, no offense to them to be doing this because there's lease stock loans, there's commercial only lenders. It's a bit more of a kind of more difficult landscape. So make sure if you are talking to a broker prior to kind of speaking with me or, or buying a commercial property, they're well versed in commercial. Ask them how many deals they've done, what lenders are on their panel and go through that. Similar, similar to residential, but again, they need to be well versed in commercial. That really surprises me, Steve. I thought you would have been like, no, nah, still chat with them first and, and have a and make sure you got your, your finance in order first. But you're saying like, no, nah, you're even better off leaving it. it. It would make it easier if they came to me and went, oh, cool, I'm approved for a million dollars. We're good to go. Yep, my life's a bit simpler. But not if they've spoken to the, the wrong person and then we're under the finance clause of the contract, we find they actually can't get the deal done, which to be honest, I actually find most of the time happens. They, they're using their resi broker and the, the resi broker just doesn't know what they're doing and we have to crush deals because of the broker, not because of the property. Yeah, right. Yeah. There's there's so many, um, so many great questions. I just wanted to throw this one. This is about your hair. You got some regrowth. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just could couldn't help with all that. Um, have you looked at the and, video and yet, Seth? Somebody said best somebody said best. Yeah, well, I saw the video. You you have to um you I'm, I think I'm comfortable with that. I think it's okay. just hilarious. Yeah, I, I know it's not super relevant, but yeah, do a, do a post up tomorrow. Um, somebody said, thanks, thank you. This That's really helpful. There you go about the broker. Um, so I will, I'm going to pick maybe one or two because I, I know we, I mean, we could go, I'm just, I could just ask these questions all night. I, and so Steve's got people to speak to as well. Um, but somebody wanted, Prue asked a great question too. She's actually on the chat next week. I shouldn't. So I'm interested, so this is kind of a, I know this is a, a whole conversation in itself, but is there any state that you prefer to buy in or do you look for deals across the country? It's a tough question, I know. Yep, so so we, we look Australia-wide. So me and my team, we, we go through about 400 deals a week. Um, of that 400, we probably thumb mark about 10 or 20 of them. Of mm-hmm. that 10 or 20, probably only two to four of them actually come at a price where we're in negotiations that we're happy to buy it at. Um, so to sort of answer that question, I'm, I'm preferring at the moment, I buy quite a lot in Brisbane and Perth. It's probably about 50% of what I'm buying, just those two by themselves. Just you get a really good bang for buck at the moment. Like you're getting the, the five, 6% net yields, whereas Sydney, Melbourne, oh, good luck getting a five in front of it, unless it's an office space. Um, and then Adelaide and Canberra are just really tightly held regions. So they're, they're hard to actually get into the market for a good price. So there's just a bit of a more of a feeding frenzy in there. Darwin, I'm not registered in Northern Territory, but that's because I don't want to buy those. The stat I mentioned before about it being a very small town. Uh, again, not saying you can't find a good buy there. You might find a medical center or a multi-tenancy one that numbers make sense. Uh, and then the other 50% is just a mix between Adelaide, Canberra, regional towns. Um, it just, just depends what comes up. I settled on a, a, a vet in Launceston a couple months ago. Generally, if I someone said, oh, do you buy in Launceston and say no, but we've got a vet on a seven-year lease. So stuff like that comes up. Hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great great uh, map, map around the. I'm just trying to pick one sort of final question because there's. Let's see. Oh yeah, this this is kind of a a, a nice. Um, this is a, a good general kind of question that we can we can sort of finish up on unless somebody uh, uh, drops a cracker in the and we can always do what with Steve do as you say uh, if if you're not on vacation. Um, we've, we've spoken about this a little bit, but I think it's worthwhile for those who may not have seen us or seen you talk about it before. Is what's the capital growth on a commercial property like, and how similar is commercial versus resi? It's the age-old question. Uh, so, complete myth that commercial properties don't grow. It's just completely false. The reason for that, and why it kind of comes about it again, this is this is my deduction is they don't happen in the same cycles necessarily as residential. So, what happens? Residential might grow, then commercial grow. So, all these people get capital growth with residential and go, oh, residential is a way better performing commercial. When they're not growing and then commercials growing in the background, they're not talking about it. it. doesn't get media coverage. So on average, you'll get between 4.5 and 6.5% capital growth. But it depends on the type of asset you're buying. If you're buying a high-density office space in the CBD, that doesn't have a land component. That's not going to grow the same as a, a standalone house, much similar to how a high-density residential apartment isn't going to grow the same as a house. They don't have that land component. So... Strip it back. The fundamentally, if you get a good land component, it's supply and demand plus that land component, you will get the same capital growth. And you kind of have to. It has to remain somewhat on par because if you've got like, say you have a $500,000 warehouse and it's next to a million dollar residential house in some suburb, if that million dollar house goes to say $2 million over the next 10 years, the warehouse can't sit there at 500000 because all those people in the $2 million house are going to be like, why am I buying another $2 million house when this, when this commercial property that's 500000 has three times more rent and it's net? So, mm. so then that'll shift. So that's, that's where you get the kind of ebbs and flow of how that happens out of cycle. That's what's happened in the last 30 years. At the moment, we're seeing capital growth in both. The market's just crazy. Commercial's grown about mm. 20 30% in the last two years, same as residential. So you can get it. But to answer the question... Just depends on the type of asset you're buying. Uh, retail will have slightly different capital growth to industrial, completely different to industrial, different land components, lease terms, yields, areas around the city, capital growth, all that. So, so it's just case by case, but you do get capital growth. I don't know why it's a misconception that they don't. Yeah. Um, how, how, how are you feeling, Todd? Have we got time for, because there's one question that I'd be interested in Polizzi's, um opinion on, I mean, just because I think it's a, 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 a macro question. I think he's probably thought about it a little bit. Okay, let's do it. Sorry, let's, let's do it, man. I'm feeling rubbish, yeah. but let's let's keep going. Okay, I'm, yeah, mate. Um, yeah, you've absolutely sold it on. You're, you're not feeling too well. So, um, so somebody said putting aside property being a hedge. Um, where do, where do you see interest rates affecting commercial values in the next couple of years? If cap rates remain constant, the rates go up. Shouldn't values decline? You shouldn't. How do we? Yeah, so I, I get I get asked this in pretty much every day now. <laughs> Uh, I want to premise this on this fact. I actually don't care what happens to interest rates. I buy properties based on the next 20 years. When I was two years ago, people weren't asking me this question. Was I like, what happens if there's hyperinflation in two years' time? Buy with the fundamentals in place for long term. You can't change any of that. The, if that person's solution is they're going to wait the market out and hope for it to kind of demise, cool, good luck. I'm yet to meet any investor, even in the residential market, that has somehow capitalized on markets crashing. Like in the last 30 years, they've quadrupled in value. So by you sitting out of the market, you're just missing out on opportunity costs. Um, in addition to that, I showed you at the start of the segment, what happens when interest rates go up in terms of your cash flow? You're still very cash flow positive. So as long as you're not looking to refinance that property, it actually doesn't matter what the value is. Obviously, we want some capital growth so we can basically harvest that equity and go again. So, But the, in terms of the cash flow, it doesn't matter. What normally happens if interest rates go up, so do rents. Rents match it because the money has to be there. People need to make money. Cost of goods and services go up as well. So the cap rate will actually remain the same. And it's similar to three years ago when interest rates for commercial were three and a half, four and a half percent. I was buying six and a half, seven percent net yields very easily. Now that you can get a 2.5% interest rate, I'm buying 5.5% net yields. So the cash flow is actually remaining the same, even though you could theoretically argue the cap rate. But then what I'm actually seeing now is with inflation, rents are going to go up quite a lot because most, most leases are CPI. 
So if we see some inflation, the rents are going to go up as well. I'm not an economist, no, and I put my hand up and I actually say I don't understand the economy as well as so many other guys out there, but I wasn't considering what happens to interest rates five years ago. I will stress test my portfolio. I will look at the property and go, what happens at 5% interest rate? What happens at 10%? So I can plan for it, but I can't affect it. So you're either going to buy, you're not going to buy. I'm yet to meet an investor that has done well from not buying property. There you go. <laughs> I, think that's, I wish that was my quote. Can I change my <laughs> quote at the start to Steve Polisi? <laughs> I'm yet to meet an investor that's that was, done well by not buying property. That's brilliant. Yeah. 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 Right, so I think that's... That that's a that's a nice little way to um and I, I want to be yeah you've done done fantastic thanks for jumping on as a, as a guest co-host um yeah, it's wanna, yeah. yeah, probably so, exactly. yeah somebody said love it so I think that might be uh that was oh, that was Kylie so Kylie yeah I, I think I got to yeah Aaron dropped a couple of questions as well so thanks for the regulars jumping in um so if, Steve if anyone has um, any questions Jeff just shoot me a DM I'll answer it there or we'll put it on the what would Steve do segment so that's fine I'm I'm happy to chat with people yeah yeah usually discourage dms but we've, we've, we've got we've, we've got an admin person who's now going to take over my role um of, of telling people off and he's even got some new emojis apparently i don't know he's been telling us all about it so he's excited so yeah um look thank really appreciate it. look i've i've learned so much i thought that due diligence was kind of for those who thought it was boring i don't know have you been entered um, apart from being a, a little sort of sweaty and all that's tight have you learned a thing or two about commercial yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, I think yeah. this is something that I learned that I'm definitely not going to buy my first commercial pr- like by myself. Um, I'll be giving Steve a call. And that's not an endorsement or an ad for Steve. That's just a genuine looking at that list. I'm not a detailer and I'm pretty sure I would stuff things up. Yeah, yeah. It's um yeah, and it's it's a sort of thing that even if you are detailed, it's it's if you don't I mean, if I, I don't cut my hair every day, I'd probably cut my hair okay but i might end up with like a bowl a justin bieber bowl cut which you I cut might your hair up. every day no no i'm saying yeah I, mean, I don't cut my hair but let's just say i don't cut my hair every couple of months or whatever um so yeah that's a yeah I, I'm, I'm still haven't nailed my analogies apparently it's a it's a it's a skill but it, you can improve your analogies so i've got a lot of work but really appreciate you jumping on as well the steve polizzi um mate, you've you've absolutely delivered the gold the energy's there um the regrowth is there as well but no, i think so <laughs> Thanks for, thanks for putting up with my um, amateur kind of ad playing as well. No. Joe will be back next week. Don't worry about it. But um, but yeah, is there anything you? What, what what's the what's the final kind of couple of thoughts or final couple of sentences you'd like to leave the audience with, Steve? And how do people yeah. reach out to you? Oh, go go get my book, free copy of the book. Don't forget that. I was pro- only till Friday. Only till what, Friday. What Friday? Is it it's back to fifty percent, but um, get that. Um, any questions? Reach out, but. Just get involved. Buy, go buy something, do the work, and you'll do well long-term. Thanks very much. And, and Todd, uh, it's, oh, somebody said, can, can commercial still be affordable? Why? We'll answer that in a what would Steve do, Tim. Sorry, we're, um, we're sort of almost at two hours. So, well, we um, should be sort of 300K so, commercial at the start. So there you go. That's cheaper yeah. than most Aussies. That's a quick one. Yeah, people keep just kind yeah. of keep asking questions. They're, they want to get this giveaway. And I'll, I'll, I'll nominate those people, and um, maybe I'll, I'll – I'll go back and look at the comments and just and send them a message as well and put them in contact because that's going to be a great prize. But thanks, Todd, and um, I've, I've been excited. And as Joe says, let's uh, let's go and buy property or commercial. Let's go and do due diligence on commercial property. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye.